Suzanne McAuliffe. I'm the Yarmouth Delegate to the Assembly of Delegates, which is Barnstable County Legislative Branch. Uh, I'm here just to give a quick update and uh, also to ask for volunteers at, at the end of my uh, little update. We are starting our budget. We will receive the budget from the County Commissioners at our next meeting, the first Wednesday in February. We will also receive the capital budget at that time. They developed the budget with a budget message of no new hires, trying to keep everything balanced, keep everything um, within within the revenues, and to not use reserves to balance the budget. So they're using a very stringent budget uh, development. They have been able to get on top of some of the past issues. They've been able to pay off about three million of a seven to eight million dollar um, debit that we owe, owed ourselves. The capital is going to be very um, small this year. We don't, I don't have that yet, but it's going to be money for the Fire Training Academy and then two other purchases. And for, for the county, that's very, very small. They're focusing on trying to get the financial house in order still. The second dredge is done. Finally uh, completed. I don't know if you've had a report on that. It's uh, uh, up and running in terms of being tested right now. Uh, they're running sand through it, literally. So um, I know this impacts uh, Yarmouth because this, we are, have a Bass River, two Bass River projects, I believe, coming up with the second dredge. So um, there was some worry about that, but we should be able to go forward, which is, a, which is great. Uh, the uh, Cape Cod Commission, which is a county agency, as you know, has lost its executive director, Paul Nizwicki. The Board of County, uh, excuse me, yes, the Board of County of, um, Hitcock commissioners, the executive board has recommended that the acting deputy, the deputy director become the acting director, and that's Christy Senatori, DY graduate, very uh, well qualified, very um, uh, capable young woman, and uh, the county commissioners will have uh, a say in this at their next meeting. But that is the recommendation currently of the um, uh, executive board of the Hitcock Commission. Uh, the county is uh, turning over most of the jail space to the state because they need it and they want it for the court system. Uh, so, so, excuse me, not the jail space, the court space. We are taking over the jail space, which is that big brick building at the top of the hill that has phenomenal views but needs massive renovation because it was a, it was a pretty sad jail at one point. So we will be moving up the hill to that to turn the court buildings over to the state which means that they will be leasing from the county and they will be also paying uh, not only lease but maintenance and capital and it is a benefit to us to have them have the space. Uh, we, will, we are considering a charter review. We have decided exactly how we're going to do that. That is how the county government is organized. Just as Yarmouth has its own charter, the county regional government has a charter and the assembly will be taking that matter up. We're required to do one every few years. Uh, the county commissioners have um, voted on co uh, policy for a code of conduct for public officials. They've voted on social media policies. They voted on vehicle use. Um, so there's been a lot of um, kind of housekeeping things, policies that we're missing that are um, now in place. The, um, one of the reasons I wanted to come before you tonight is the former Cape Cod um, Economic Development Council is now the Barnstable County Economic Development Net Council, and it has kind of been formalized and brought in under the uh, county as a county agency, and it will have its job uh, beefed up and, and kind of
kind of more formalized. It will be working with the Cape Cod Commission on some of its um, economic development work. So it's a it's a it's a, a, a better structure because it is under the county and it's accountable to the county. But it's also very helpful in that it will be helping the, the uh, Cape Cod Commission with some of its economic development requirements. They are looking for volunteers. This was just signed into law, I guess you could say, the, the ordinance went through in, in early December. And uh, people can let your board of selectmen know, or you can let the county commissioners know directly. Um, there will be 11 voting members and three additional ex officio members, and they will represent the main economic interests of the region, including private sector, public officials, community leaders, private individuals, representatives of workforce development boards, institutions of higher education, minority and labor groups, and others who can contribute to and benefit from improved economic development in the region. So anyone who has an interest, um, certainly put your name forward because um, this would be a, a, a the beginning of a group that I think will have a big impact. And this is also the group that will make recommendations on how to use some of the license plate money as well, which is was sort of the, one of the jobs of the former group. So it's been a, a re reworking of the Economic Development Council. And that's my update. If you want, I'm going to leave, actually I'll leave the ordinance with you and then everyone can have a copy of it and um, so that you know exactly what the economic development of the Barnesville County is going to look like. And, and I know that's a concern of Yarmouth in terms of uh, trying, to, trying to spur economic development and keep economic development active. Um, and you can uh, then distribute that to your selectmen. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Anybody else would like to address the board? Speaker? So I was uh, most interested in seeing the article on the, uh, the uh, uh, that might go on the warrant uh, uh, with regard to the marijuana. Uh, I'm just wondering, are the town planning board and uh, our so-called businessmen in town aware that the Justice Department invoked the supremacy of the federal law and the new U.S. attorney in Massachusetts said he will implement it? Are the same people aware that banks, almost within the hour after that announcement from the Justice Department, pulled a plug on the use of credit cards uh, uh, in the car shops? Uh, no fools they. They don't want to come into the crosshairs of the IRS or the Justice Department. And so, uh, so do, you, do these people who are uh, proposing to continue with this, uh, and, and uh, even with the zoning proposal, do they still think that uh, the pie shops uh, uh, are going to produce a profit? And who, who will even know this is going to be a cash uh, situation? So. I mean, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, in spite of the foregoing and the fact that 54% of the voters voted against the new law, the planning board voted to insert the zoning article in the warrant. Uh, are they saying that public housing projects and pot shops constitute economic development in town? No, I think you misunderstood, Rita. First of all, um, we I didn't want to misunderstand any. No, I think you misunderstand the purpose of the article being placed on town meeting mm -hmm. warrant. We're hopeful, or at least I am, there will be another article to ban them all together. But if that doesn't pass, we have to be prepared to make sure that we create an area and rules of which that they can go in. So we have no opportunity. That, we have no other. That assumes <coughs> that the Justice Department didn't say anything about that. It didn't issue that statement that's about a, the supremacy, supremacy of the federal law. If we law. do nothing, they will be able to be located anywhere they want with no rules. They may not be able to do anything, period, great. If, if the, uh, 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 but if uh, the Justice Department prevails. And the, uh, apparently, the U.S. Attorney here in Massachusetts seems to be uh, on track to, to, to do just that. No, I, I, I realize that. <coughs> But I mean, why, why muddy the waters? I mean, uh, my, my last uh, statement is why muddy the waters with a zoning article unless the proponents, and I assume uh, uh, that includes many of the so-called businessmen here in town, uh, are uh, going to pack the town meeting and uh, to vote down the uh, ban article, which I assume will be there. Well, it's potential, it will be. and if we have no article there, then they can be located next to your house. So that's why we 
let me put it there. I, I still say I think that the situation has changed considerably. Once, once the, uh, the, the uh, Justice Department issued that statement, I think we have to uh, uh, think that uh, the Justice Department and the uh, U.S. Attorney here will follow through. Because the government always makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, unless you don't believe that the, in the supremacy of the federal law, I haven't seen it work so far. Anybody else, Christine? That's because we were involved in the I just have a point of clarification. At this point, is public comment the only time people do a comment on items on the agenda tonight? Um, or will you allow comments later on? Like the, you know, the only time that we'll allow comment after this will be related to the um, public hearing on beach stickers. Okay, so people, anybody <coughs> who wants to speak there is, a, yeah. there is a continued hearing, but I'm somewhat confused about what's going to happen there. Um, okay. I'm um, understanding that the petitioner is going to ask for a continuance. If that does not happen, then I suppose you know, we have to allow public comment. Okay. So what I'm going to say to you is this is my first dip at something that I want to sit and then let some other people talk because I know there's a lot of them here to talk. <coughs> I'm going to be here to talk about... Hold on, wait a minute. So this is one that we could do a day that um, we, we do intend to... to to request that, and, and okay. therefore allow people to speak now as they... Okay, so people who want to speak about Jane could speak now also. I'm going to speak first of all on the marijuana, and then I'll sit down and listen to other people talk, and then I have another thing. Um, tonight, uh, as you saw, as you well know, and Tom Connolly from our committee is here also, in the Substance Awareness Committee, um, we are violently opposed, uh, I think as Veda's also clearly made it uh, clear too, uh, we do not want to see anything but a ban here in town. Um, and so as a consequence, I've actually met with the planning board, who's had the unfortunate task of having to look at 107 pages of regulations I have in here from um, the state, which keep changing, which allow, you know, marijuana cafes, marijuana, all kinds of delivery services. That ought to be fun for Frank, who's going to discover who's the drug dealer and who's the delivery service. And maybe he's going to have a you know, sign on the top of it for the pot. But, um, Anyway, um, but I will meet with the FinCom also. But tonight, I left at your table place, and I wanted to explain what I left. I left a one-page summary from um, the Marijuana Policy Institute, because it really has some good citations and things you can go look at about the issues of marijuana and why we are so concerned about it as a public health and public safety issue. Secondly, there's a guidance uh, document that I then put in that says, Guidance for Municipalities Regarding Marijuana for Adult Use and that's basically sort of a summary of that. Because also now all of a sudden they're talking about cultivation co-ops, where other people can get together, create a co-op. You know, maybe farmers can have farm stands out front, you know, things like that. They're getting wilder and wilder in what they're doing. Another document in there is the mass tax revenue distribution. And one of the things, a study out of Rhode Island is coming out saying that you know, actually you're spending 120% of revenue in terms of, of actually enforcing marijuana regulation. So it's not a revenue generator, and I think our FinCon has believed that to be so. Um, and I and really want to make sure, because if you think about it, the state's going to collect 10.75, and this is if people are honestly reporting what they're selling. Um, and um, at this point, there's now another document that I gave you because this Cannabis Commission has now done an impact of drug and marijuana arrests within the new largest cities in Massachusetts, and they're proposing that a lot of the revenue coming from uh, throughout the state, even from Yarmouth or wherever, will then go into, and they've identified 25 towns who have high unemployment, high minorities, so they can have a, a, a proportionate share of the business and the money and the revenues and things. The mayor of Boston has said, heck no, but you need to see that document. It's absolutely fascinating. And then the final thing is, if you think about it, with us being allowed to take 3%, we will get 30000 on a million dollars of marijuana sale in this community. And so you've really, really got to take a look at that. So the, the wording that has been put in this 107-page document about the Community Reinvestment Fund uh, documents in the 25 towns name, I think is significant. And that's why I gave you this packet, because it's a little bit easier to read it. And then I want to remind everyone publicly that February 6th, from 9 to 12 at Barnstable Town Hall, will be a hearing by the commission, the, Canada, the Can Cannabis Commission, down here on Cape Cod for public testimony and concerns. So February 6th, 9 a.m. to 12 noon at Barnstable Town Hall. And I don't know, Tom, if you wanted to follow up on anything. No, I think Okay, 
be happy to speak now, or I, don't, I know we have a space in the gym, um, but Eric Stevens is going to be doing so. Yep, we'll, we'll wait, we'll wait okay. until mm -hmm. you're in Jackson. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Yes. I just want to take a few minutes uh, to, to introduce you, uh, yourself. <coughs> yes, my name is Susan Burnett. <coughs> um, I have a copy uh, with me of the 2007 agreement that was signed between the then selectmen and K-20. And I just wanted to um, note to the extent that the agreement you all are contemplating is crafted after the 2007, I contain some of the same comments and paragraphs. I just wanted to make the following observations. Some of the paragraphs in here are fairly boilerplate, <coughs> standard kinds of paragraphs you would see in any kind of agreement. They relate to the work schedule, the road access, road improvements, and things like that. However, there are other paragraphs that are extremely noteworthy. And to the, as I said, to the extent that what you're contemplating is crafted after the event, I, I offer the following observations. In this original uh, signed document, paragraph 10B, which is one of my favorites, requires that the town not make any reference to the existence of the agreement that they signed on TV, radio, and the press until Cape Wind commences, quote, commercial, uh, commercial operations. A term, by the way, which is not defined anywhere in the agreement. Um, so they found the hands of the town, found them to silence, and I just don't know how that is in anyone's public interest, and certainly not the interest of the property of the residents of the island. And while the town's hands were bound, it's interesting to note that the paragraph in that the developer is allowed to disclose an agreement not only to his financiers, but to the regulatory and permitting um, parties. And there's a final paragraph in that uh, 11, uh, Section 10B that says the agreement could also be used in subsequent judicial proceedings as may be necessary or appropriate, which seems to me it's leaving the town in potential long term uh, legal, extensive legal, lengthy legal entanglements. Um, uh, there's another, so what that paragraph does, 10B does, is explain why, explains to me why the residents of Yarmouth had no knowledge of that signed paragraph at all because the town council. In, that the selectmen in no way could talk about it publicly. I find that very strange. Uh, and I certainly hope you don't duplicate that instead. Another paragraph in there is paragraph 7 that addresses the mitigation fund. And a careful reading will show that the so-called yearly payment isn't quite as generous as it was portrayed. In fact, the payment is made up of two parts, the required tax payment, and then a sum that would equal the difference between the required tax payment and whatever you all uh, you know, were going to agree to. So since this is a 30-year project, it is conceivable that in the out years, the tax payment would each just equal the lump sum payment, and the town would actually get no additional benefit uh, from signing the agreement. There are other paragraphs which additionally dilute the town's authority, such as the section that will allow, it will allow Cape Wind to proceed with construction. Even if the town's independent inspector concluded that Cape Wind was not conducting the project, in, and this is a direct quote, in material compliance with required permits, I find that <laughs> Amazing. And then speaking of it, this is another favorite, speaking of diluting the town's authority, the, the, the document sets up the mitigation fund, which basically is made up of citizens that will go to pass a lot of the money. Uh, it's made up of five people. Cape Wind chose one. The town was allowed to chose, choose four, only with the consent of Cape Wind. And that's in the signed agreement. Uh, again, I find that unusual. I could go on and on, but you get my point. Uh, if the agreement you're currently contemplating is modeled after this Cape Wind agreement, I would say it's definitely not in the best interest. Uh, of course, we don't know for sure because none of us have even seen the draft agreement that you all contemplate. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that if all of these things were corrected, that I would think that the assigned agreement, this community agreement, is a good thing. I, I don't. Uh, the agreement basically buys on trade into Lewis Bay in exchange for money. It's as simple as that. The entry brings irreparable harm to the bay and no amount of money can prevent that. You all received a letter, I think, last week signed by at least eight associations along Lewis Bay that firmly believe that. Uh, you all know the EPA offices have been established at the federal, state, and local level that prevent the abuse of public, the use of public lands for private profit. Lewis Bay is a public good. It's owned by the people in this room, yourself included. Rest of the Cape and the citizens of Massachusetts. <coughs> now, elected officials, you act as our trustee in this matter. So I'm here to tell you as a citizen, I don't think Lewis Bay is for sale. I hope Lewis Bay is not for sale. 
and I would urge you not to sign any community agreement that would jeopardize the uh, would jeopardize Blue's Bay. Thank you. Tracy, I'm not aware of any letter that we're con contemplating. Is that that's not an issue anymore, is it? It's the original November uh, 2017 uh, load entry agreement that we had with Vineyard when that was up in front of you back in November. That's Wait. the document that she's referencing the original Cape right. Wind contract document. Well, no, she said there is a current document that we are contemplating. <coughs> that's the one. Yeah, Technically, here tonight was to be the night of part two of the hearing right. that was held back in November. So you're still, in theory, under public hearing rules. I thought we had decided that we weren't going to sign that, but maybe I misunderstood. Mm -hmm. I'm Susan Stark, <coughs> so you don't get your next two turn, two to four turn that way. Uh, in Yarmouth or and um, I would like to speak in strong support of pursuing um, vineyard, wind, vineyard Wind because it's so important for us to address climate change as much as a lot of us um, might even snicker at it. Um, it is, it's happening and we already are seeing it with extreme weather on the Cape. So it is really important to me that we fully vet this option because it's a chance for us to bring an economic gain to the area that could maybe help with the use of that disaster. Are you a young president? Yes, that would be important. Thank you. Uh, and I'm on 6A, which is not far from where this path would go, and I'm also um, here on behalf of quite a few people who are in my church at the Unitarian Church of Barnstable. Oh, sorry, I just want to make sure you were there. Yep. Um, so I'll live along the path and other people who would have liked to have been here are on Higgins Crow or close to it. It is inconvenient. It's not fun to think about two-level sea rise hitting any part of the Cape, let alone worse than that. And I just think we need to like take a deep breath and realize this is happening. We do need to face it. It's very inconvenient to have any work done on our roads. But going to the meeting last night from Vineyard, when they answered all the questions, we've been listening to folks some of the folks in the room, and trying to then say, what about Lewis Bay? What about nitrogen loading? What about this and that? And we're getting answers, good answers to every question that we ask, and knowing that they need more time to address um, the specific concerns. So I think that's why the continuation is going to be important for tonight, because everybody's concern in this room is really important. But I just want to say we've got to fully vet it, and don't just close our mind to it, because we would like to think it's not happening. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. Is there anything else you'd like to go before Joe? I'm sure. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to give you a quick update on the schools. I've been by a while, just like a lot of things, school vacation, things like that. I wanted to thank Tracy and Mike for coming out in um, December for the celebration of the champions for a football team. Um, that team worked many years since they've been eighth graders to uh, to get to that Super Bowl victory. So the, uh, the community is very proud of them. Thank you for everybody coming out. Coach Funk, each NFL team nominates a high school coach uh, for the Don Shula Award every year, uh, as Andre Tippett calls him, Dr. Coach Funk. Um, was nominated for that award, and that award will be uh, given out uh, at the Pro Bowl on Saturday. So. Um, so hopefully, we don't know who won, but hopefully that would be a great next recognition for him. Um, we are recently, uh, in our last meeting, visited by um, Senator Julian Sear, who came by to discuss things going on at, um, in, uh, at the State House. We talked about talked to him about transportation reimbursement, how the regional school districts don't get all the transportation money back, and uh, he's, he's going to work with the uh, legislation on that. The governor's budget, we asked him a few questions about that, and that's still up in the air. A lot of things up in the air, and we already the um, initiatives to their um, delegation was put together. So it was good to sit with him and get updated from him. Um, our school budget update: the committee adopted a preliminary budget, and uh, no surprise, there is an increase this year. Um, it is a starting point. It's from we're starting here, and we're going to hopefully work in the next month or two to get in, within a, um, a manageable range you know, that, that would be uh, good for everyone, and good for our students. Um, there are a lot of unknowns. Um, in this, the, uh, the governor's budget hasn't come out. The health care numbers that I think came out today. Um, so we'll be working with those. And in negotiations, we're negotiating currently with the teachers union 
the secretaries, the services unions, and the um, uh, and the service employees unions. Um, Monday we'll meet for the second time. Norm is a part of that. He's been in on every meeting, so I'm glad that, that he's there um, to kind of guide us and uh, have his input on that. Um, we're also entering into bus contract and custodial negotiations, so we'll be working with that. So there's a lot of unknowns up there um, right now. Uh, as far as the Madikis uh, Building Committee is concerned, um, we submitted to the MSBA a recent um, proposal uh, about a month ago, and they came back to us and asked us to tighten up our, our scope of the um, options. So our committee voted at our last meeting to tighten that up. Um, it basically came down to a fourth to seventh grade building which would be located at the Station Avenue School, uh, those grounds right there. So we're looking at that, we're going to be talking about that, and we'll be having um, Butters meetings and things like that come up uh, very soon. Um, we're on track as far as where we're going, you know, to, to build it. Our next submission to the MSBA will be in mid-March. Um, some good news about that, the uh, MSBA sets the reimbursement rates every January. January 17, our reimbursement rate is 44 and a quarter. Uh, we just got the reimbursement rate for 2018, and it's 54.16. So 54.16%. Um, will be funded by the MSBA. Uh, that's not, we're not going to get 54%. The effective rate will be, will be lower that, than that because some things aren't covered fully by the uh, MSBA. So that's good news. It's 10% higher in the way you look at it. Um, we'll be getting a, a big project like this. this is, that's uh, pretty good. So that's my update. And uh, let's see if it's a full house. And, you know, give somebody my seat. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'll stand. <coughs> Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to address the board? Yes, sir. Uh, I apologize for being late. Could I uh, speak on the uh, opinion of when? Um, I think we're going to yes. have our public hearing, our public portion of the public comment section now. Okay. Um, we're going to move to continue that. So um, I don't believe we'll be uh, having a public hearing on that. So if there's anything you'd like to say, if you could say it briefly now, that would be great. I, I would. Um, <coughs> My name is John Noriso, and I know some of you. And uh, you know, lifelong uh, summer resident. In the last five years, uh, retired. I, I live on Lewis Bay. Uh, I'm 72 years old, and I've watched Lewis Bay my entire life. Um, just a little bit of history. This will only take a minute, but I think it's informative. Uh, there's documented history of the British Man of War fleet in Lewis Bay in the War of 1812. Uh, what does that mean? That means a deep draft sailboat could go into Lewis Bay. I dare say without the ship channel, that would not be possible today. So fast forward, 1946, Lewis Bay was still, if you will, in its original state. The ship channel was dredged in 1946 by the Corps of Engineers, a public works project. Hyannis Harbor built as we know it today. Everybody at the time said it's a great idea. Well, probably, especially if you're from Nantucket. <coughs> in 1980, the Steamship Authority comes to Hyannis. Great idea, especially if you're from Nantucket. What does that entail? Deep draft vessels in and out of the bay, 25, 30 trips a day. 1990s, we get the fast ferries, more of the same. 1995, we get the, uh, the Citizens of Great Island do a private beach nourishment project. They dredge a large hole, if you will, between the ship channel and Great Island and pump thousands and thousands of yards onto the, the little southwest <coughs> face of Great Island. All of that sand has ended up in Lewis Bay. 1998, the ship channel was dredged and the opening to the channel facing Hyannis Port was changed, and the channel was widened and deepened. What has that done is it's caused more water flow through the ship channel. Not long thereafter, the gut, the original natural opening to Lewis Bay, <coughs> sealed itself up. So by 2010, we have only one narrow ship channel in and out of Lewis Bay. That's it. You study, and I'm not a scientist, but all the people who know it tell me the bay is dying. Every estuary and the entire circumference of Lewis Bay is going south. Mm -hmm. um, we've got all kinds of polluted pockets here and there. And it's getting worse almost on a daily basis. Now, to bring it up to 2018, I went to the presentation last night with the Vineyard Wind folks presented. I was astonished. They had 25-year-old navigable charts 
and no aerial photography that was newer than 2010-2011, uh, outdated information. As we speak, there's something like two aircraft carriers sitting in Lewis Bay, known as the extension of Smith Point. This, and if you had said to someone, I want to bring an aircraft carrier into Lewis Bay, people would have said, you're crazy. Well, we've got two of them in the bay, and we're now in the entrance every day through, if you will, accretion. <coughs> Mount Calvis, which was built when the dredging project was blown into the bay. The bay is dying, folks. And the, this is one of those rare times in life where if you're a citizen of Yarmouth, you care about the bay, the best thing to do right now is do nothing. Because to tinker with it any further, not knowing and understanding all the ramifications of what could happen, none of which are good. I, I, I just think, you know, it, it's time to hit the neutral button. You know, after a couple of years of study, we understand what's happening to the Bay. Might be different, but we're not there today. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, so we're going to see if there's anybody who has any new yeah. comments first. Yeah. <laughs> and then in the back, do you have more questions? Um, so I'll uh, have a quick question. Um, my name is, yeah, sure. Um, my name is Ann Mayo, and um, I uh, have moved here um, somewhat permanently. <laughs> um, I'm originally from the Washington, D.C. area, but I've been coming here since I was a uh, toddler. And um, my family has been coming here for. Um, several different generations. Um, I'm actually here today to talk to you about uh, the Yarmouth Dog Park. And um, one quick question I wanted to address to everybody was, um, how many people in this room have dogs? Raise your hand. Okay. And how many people get off at 5 p.m.? <laughs> Just, and no one in this gets off later than 5 p.m. or 5 p.m.? Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, okay, sorry. Um, at any rate, so I'm here basically because uh, 40 active members of the dog park are interested in, uh, in purchasing and installing uh, solar motion floodlights. Um, the, uh, the purchase and installation would be um, funded solely through private donations from local businesses and individuals. And basically, I've um, been asked to kind of oversee this project. And uh, really, um, there were only a couple issues that I had regard, uh, regarding this. Um, and I didn't know if we take questions or if this just is kind of, no, what, you know, I, just what to. I think, I think I just don't want to, I don't no, want to minimize what you're saying because it's very important. I think the whole board no, um, is relevant. Would, would love to hear what you're saying, but I think it's appropriate if you'd like to have some dialogue about this. Well, if, if you work with the town administrator to um, come back as an agenda topic, where we can sit down and actually ask questions and okay. possibly make a decision, we're not able to do that in public session without being well. Advertised. Sure, I understand. Um, actually, I've had uh, quite a few um, email exchanges, and I've met with Carl Van mm -hmm. who's the head of department of natural resources. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also working with Lorraine, who is the president of the uh, Friends of Yarmouth Dog Park. So I, I just wanted to um, get this on the agenda, so because I know that there are rules, uh, regulations, guidance, or guidelines, and protocols to follow, um, but I did want to get it on the docket so that um, we can coordinate and, and basically get this in uh, kind of on uh, a, a quick path. Get it moving. Yeah. I hear you. Okay. All right, Ms. Mayo, first of all, I appreciate your time. Sure. Um, if you'll work with Dan, the town administrator. Okay, great. Um, and getting that on our on an upcoming agenda where we have some availability, we'd really love to hear your proposal and be able to discuss it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir. Hi, my name's Dave Self. I live in West Yarmouth. have for, for 70 years of my life. I've been here half time so far. Uh, I'm going to address the, I want to address the tally, Dr. Eric's been over our house for a play date with my uh -oh. son. No. <laughs> not recently. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to address the, the, the beach sticker thing that's coming up. I overheard a conversation that I wasn't supposed to overhear. It was a meeting in front of the sailing club uh, about a week ago. 
And it seems that the intention is to make Anglewood Beach a pay beach, a sticker pay beach, and to have a pay boat ramp down there, I believe. That's what I overheard. And there was another gentleman there that I won't mention because he's not here. But I think to make Anglewood Beach a pay beach is a disservice to the people of the town of Yarmouth. That has always been a community beach. It's not what you would call a tourist beach. The people that go there are young families with young kids, and they go there because it's a safe, quiet beach. I think to impose another fee on them would not be right. And there's people that come down there to work as they come down to that beach, they stay for a half an hour and eat their lunch and watch the water and watch the people on the beach, and then they leave. For them to have to pay a fee to do that is not fair. Then there's the elderly people that go down there and they just sit on the park bench. They sit there till the heat gets to them and they go home. Do they now have to pay another $30 beach sticker fee to do that? And you have the people who go shell fishing there in Lewis Bay, which is going to be open soon for shell fishing. They already pay a fee for a, a shellfish license. Are they now, in addition, going to have to pay a sticker fee to park to go shell fishing? They're only there for maybe an hour if they're slow. <laughs> and then there's people that have boats out there. They've already paid a fee to have a mooring in Lewis Bay. Are they now going to be required to have a, a beach sticker and pay another fee to park and use their boat for half a day or however long they use it? I think this is a disservice to the people that live in that neighborhood, and that is primarily a neighborhood beach just like Colonial Acres is a neighborhood beach. And it's the last two beaches in this town that you don't have to pay for. I think the people of this town deserve to have something free. It's just us. It's not like a prime beach. It's not like you're going to Seagull Beach where there's all kinds of things going on. It's a quiet little neighborhood beach. I feel it should be left as a quiet, no-pay beach. Thank you. I live in this oh, area. Excuse me. Mr. Self, I'd just like to say that that is not part of what we're looking at. Not the beach sticker thing? No. Good. It's not part of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to add consideration. It's not. Okay. Not tonight. I mean, I don't know what's coming up. I have. I, that's the first I've heard of it. Yeah, I don't think anybody's supposed to know about it yet. Okay, well, um, I'd really like to do that, I promise. Can you make it more on topic? Yeah, I'll try. Get a mix. The voice carries. I've tried it fast. Um, obviously, um, one of the things, and I think there should be a misconception uh, cleared up, we support wind power. We are supporting wind farms. There are two other proponents looking to land at already previously approved points elsewhere. This has nothing to do with that. This has everything to do with the use of Lewis Bay and the issues around the use of Lewis Bay. So please do that. I'm interested in the tonight. The Chamber of Commerce is going to be here about branding. And i got to tell you, we're going to get branded as Lewis Bay, which is the landing point for the power grid. And i got to tell you, you would need a love canal if a, a Cape Cod or Massachusetts, if anything happens out there. So I think the issue of branding, when you take a look at a map of Cape Cod, there aren't so many places up on the top side in Yarmouth Port. There are everything that we have, and all the recreational, the fishing, the boating, everything is all in this bay. It doesn't belong here. It belongs with a different landing. And they have even said to me it's cheaper for them to come in. The cost to us is immense. Secondly, I want to talk about the other part. I went and looked at the ocean front, only the ocean front of Butters. Anybody who owns an ocean front home from the point of the Highness Line all the way out to Gammon Point. And I did on my research, it's 135 homes. They pay $2.1 million in real estate taxes, which is almost five times what this proponent is preparing to give you to destroy that. I'm not talking about the people who live across the street on their properties or see the ocean. I'm talking about specifically those people who are direct to butters. How happy are they about that? They're already giving you 2.1 million. I think there's serious issues, and there's serious issues that have not been addressed by it. And when you ask them questions, they tell you they've talked with various people. When I go to talk to those people, they tell me they haven't heard anything. So I don't know what to say. Thank you. Please keep in mind that the uh, Nantucket Alliance, which won that beautiful victory, is now busy trying to make sure, and, and I don't know what the exact name of it is, but make sure that the appropriate um, entity will declare that area, tell you Horseshoe Shoals, I guess, or, or whatever. Uh, as a national treasure, it probably be something else, but 
something that will not allow any kind of construction, development, or anything else uh, in that area. So I wonder whether the transmission lines would come under something like that. I think maybe you will want to talk or even ask the older partner to come back and, and tell you what they're doing, what they're about. Okay, moving on to our um, 615 item, uh, <laughs> marijuana legislation update. I see town council is here. How are you? Good evening. Um, I'm not sure a great um, place to have some dialogue. Yes, yeah, yeah. There you go. Good evening. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Um, Excuse me, please. Uh, Jay Tallerman, your town council. There is not uh, a ton to report in terms of legislative update. There has been a few things, but nothing that really affects some of the major ticket items that uh, have happened. There were some the new regulations are thick, um, and they cover a great deal of ground, but in terms of what a municipality has to deal with, I believe we issued a, a January update um, on this, there's very little that affects you. There does have to be a community hearing. That's in the regulations for any proposed facility that happens. There's a great deal of regulation regarding marijuana cafes and other social uses of that. I view that as kind of not likely anytime soon anywhere um, that I'm aware of, but if they are setting the bar for that and it's another set of regulations and processes for adopting that if the community wanted to opt into that. Uh, there's a significant amount of regulations regarding signage. Nothing really changes with that, but it, it fine tunes it a little bit. Essentially, signage cannot essentially be overtly uh, indicative of a marijuana facility. They are allowed signage, but it, it can't essentially have a big pot leaf or anything else or any, anything suggestive of any kind. A town can have additional restrictive signage requirements if it likes. Um, there's some uh, cleanup with respect to proximity to schools, just in terms of clarifying what it is, essentially puts it on par with the, the medical marijuana. I did have an opportunity over the weekend at the MMA conference to speak to a friend of mine who's former DPH uh, head counsel on marijuana affairs and is now on the Cannabis Control Commission as to whether or not there's been any discussion on the taxation breakdown as it applies to an item that we talked about previously that would be if towns decide to opt out, might they not be able to share in some of the tax <coughs> revenues? There is nothing out there right now on that. It continues to be a discussion point, however, and it continues to be a concern for us um, in terms of how we manage that for uh, the communities that we represent. Uh, as was indicated earlier, the Justice Department has chimed in nationally and locally. The U.S. Attorney in Massachusetts has given what I would call a somewhat cryptic um, a statement, reserving all rights. The, if you read between the lines there, it almost appears that uh, medical marijuana may survive any kind of scrutiny, but the jury's out on whether or not they would enforce at any point in time with respect to um, recreational marijuana. How might that affect the community if they did? First of all, that would likely affect more the private parties that are choosing to engage in that kind of commerce. The one clarification that we would have to look through is whether or not if we enter into a host community agreement that has direct payments from a facility like that, could those payments or other mitigation in kind uh, be subject to the reach of enforcement. I think anything is possible if, uh, if they come over um, and seek to equitably force the cessation of any kind of marijuana, recreational marijuana facility, then I think that that is entirely possible. There have been subsequent comments from and clarifications from the U.S. Attorney's Office and it appears that they are not quite backing down, but there is no further indication. In fact, there is an indication that they have no current plans to go after anyone for anything. But again, we are, as we have always been, subject to the federal law on this, and nothing has really changed in that. And we have fully expected with the 2016 change in federal administrations that there would be likely a higher potential. I think the private parties have more to fear, 
about that than the municipality, but it is out there. The only other update, and I think you'll hear more from um, Karen and Kathy, is that we've been working closely with Dan and Karen and Kathy and, and other folks in the community on the development of sets of bylaws and other mechanisms. There are presently five, and you'll hear more about this uh, tonight, five potential items for the warrant. One would be a revision to essentially modernize your existing uh, bylaw with respect to public consumption and other related requirements. And then we have two sets of prohibitions, which would be both zoning and general bylaw. Again, the, that's a belt and suspenders approach recommended by the Attorney General. And as you suggested, uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, we then have as a safety valve two sets of general and um, and zoning bylaws in case a ban failed where we would appropriately zone and regulate recreational marijuana in a very small um, area that we could uh, look after. And that's what we've been working on so far for the community. But as we all know, two weeks from now, we could have a whole new set of regulations and guidelines from the state at any time. Thank you. Does anybody from the board have any questions for Again, it's a work in progress. I feel like you update us probably every month. So yeah, as and, and we'll keep doing that. I mean, do we have uh, scheduled <coughs> office hours? I think every month through April now, and um, we're happy to keep giving you updates. Mm -hmm. And you'll get written advisories as well as, as we see uh, anything important coming down the pike. And I'll stick around too for um, any discussion of the general and zoning bylaws in case there's. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, Chief, I know you wanted to ask the board to uh, move up you know, when you were thinking. Are you prepared? Like now? right now is perfect. <laughs> 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 Um, good evening. Um, I came to talk about the Victim Against Women's Act grant that we received uh, through the help of Detective Michael Zantini, who was basically the author in conjunction with some other helping hands, uh, including the county. And we had some help from uh, Representative Tim Whalen, who uh, used his influence uh, throughout the state government and federal government to help us position ourselves in the best of light to get this grant. We applied for this grant at least two times in the past. Uh, and we did not get it. Uh, most of the other departments around have received this grant uh, before. And the grant is to hire a, a civilian advocate uh, to assist us with domestic violence, uh, sexual assault investigation. Domestic violence is one of the uh, uh, most frequent crimes we have in town. We handle over 350 a year. Uh, we make plenty of arrests. The black hole that we've had is not having someone to be able to follow up, uh, to work with the victims, to uh, do preventive work, to work with the family, get them to the right resources, so that we can help reduce that number. Um, we know that uh, domestic violence is a, a cycle, and we have to help break that cycle, but we as the police can only do so much. Um, we have investigations. and. You know, when the detective has a case, he gets that one done. Another one comes through the door, and he's got to pay attention to that one. This uh, position, civilian position, will allow someone to concentrate on those uh, cases, as well as trying to do our best to prevent it, and help them through the court system. And it's not necessarily to break families apart, it's to maybe, there are some uh, things that can do to can help repair damage that's been done inside families and prevent us from doing it again. We also know that uh, it's in our best interest as police officers to reduce the amount of domestic violence because they are one of the most dangerous calls we go to. Uh, and it also has a psychological pack, impact on our officers when they have to make decisions, make arrests, uh, try to play a judge right on scene to make a quick decision on what to do. Uh, they see the impact on children right in front of them, whether it's a 
physical, uh, uh, mental abuse that can take place. And we did feel health in some things. And, you know, I've been impacted myself from my years of doing it uh, and some of the very early days of my career. I still think of them often of uh, the things you had to do. So if we can reduce that incident, it's, 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 uh, it makes a healthier community. So the grant that we received is uh, pretty pretty good. It's uh, $55,000 per year uh, for four years. And if we do a good job, we will have it renewed uh, for another four years after that. There's a lot of paperwork that uh, has to be done, but I'm confident with the group that we have that we'll, we'll knock it out of the park. Um, it does have a $20,000 um, commitment from the town each year. Uh, we're working on how to accommodate that. I have my own thoughts, but I'm not sure everybody else agrees with how to do it. But I think it's a, a uh, for a $20,000 cost, I think it's a, a worthwhile investment that we're all going to benefit from. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Officer Zayden. You're welcome. Thank you. And in terms of, um, is the fifty-five thousand dollars a year gonna? Is that going to cover the salary and and, and the benefits? And you said it's fifty-five thousand. I I'm not sure the exact break breakdown, but it's about seventy-five thousand dollars to cover the the whole package. So that's why the twenty. The fifty-five is about twenty. Uh, they're trying to work some stuff with the grant to do some in-kind contributions. They've already done some of that. We're trying to. Massage a little bit more to kind of cut that twenty thousand dollar down as much as we can, but it's not an exact science, and uh, part of it is a gift of gab with uh, Detective Dean. <laughs> is there there. any consideration of? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure what the need we've been able to. Is it is it required that it's a full time person? This, this grant we applied for is a full time person. Right now, um, we have a person. It's kind of interesting how it happens through. Uh, human services money from the town that goes to Independence House. We get it back by having someone four hours a week to try to help with it, but it really, they do the best we can with it. It's, it's better than nothing, basically. Um, so, you know, one of the theories would be that that money that we're already spending on that particular position, you know, that in essence probably is not necessary anymore, that maybe we shift <coughs> that towards part of that 20000 It's not a lot of money in that piece, but you know, there's potential there to do something. Um. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a suggestion that uh, we instruct staff to find the $20,000 um, so that it doesn't have to come out of the police department's budget. For, for $80,000, we get $300,000. I hate to lose out on that. I hate to take away from the police department's <coughs> already um, strained budget. So. That motion? Uh, that is a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Yes, sir. Is there any discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, now to the second part of this. Um, that's one piece of it. Um, the second is we have to vote to accept the grant based on uh, that motion. And the third thing would be we also have a policy on any new positions that we hire within the town has to be voted on. So. Yeah, if I may, uh, Chris Lilly has um, worked with the personnel board to put his position in front because it is a new position and would be a new position for us, so it has to get uh, spot in the personnel board. And I'm not sure what the salary range ended up or the grade status on that. What was the outcome? It was a grade 11. Grade 11. They're targeting $52,000 roughly for just salary. And so it, because it occurs within the year and it's a new position, we need to have the board vote to approve the position. Um, I mean, we were still looking at avenues to fund it for this year, and it'll be built into the budget for the following year because we'll have known about it. This came into us very late in the process, but we'll uh, we'll make sure that we find the money to ensure that the hiring gets done in the time and But we do need a vote to accept the grant to establish the position tonight. So that's for both establishing the position and accepting the grant. Is that your second? Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your work. I'm just ride. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Make sure he sits in the front. All right, we're going to watch. All right. So our next public hearing is in relation to um, beach stickers. And I see Pat here. who are spread around the audience. This uh, conversation was had with the commissioners, and I represent um, them as we bring this forward. Uh, the beach parking entrance fees for non-residents have been $15 for a daily pass, $70 for a weekly pass, and $175 for a seasonal pass since 2009. In 2008, the fees were $12, $50, and $125, respectively. The residential beach pass was increased from $25 to $35 in 2008 as well. Uh, during the past 10 years, expenses to operate the beaches have increased. Infrastructure repairs and upgrades, weekly maintenance of structures and grounds, increased minimum wage and local competition for good workers, cost of materials, supplies, internet access, and uniforms have all impacted our level line item funding. We have heard <coughs> larger projects such as invasive weed remediation in parking lots, fence repairs, and restroom upgrades, we settled on retaining functional items such as faded signs, warped walkways, partially handicapped access, and limited track collection to stay within our zero growth budget. We have absorbed the increase in minimum wage, which had a trickle up impact on the miscellaneous wage schedule, and we have seen an increase of $42,000 in our expenses in the last 10 years. The annual survey of beach fees conducted by the Cape Cod Beach Managers Association <coughs> shows that all Mid-Cape towns are charging $20 daily for a pass, for a one-day pass, and Dennis charges $25 daily and $30 on a week that weekend day and holiday for a pass. This info was updated. Um, this info was updated since the survey was completed, which was attached to this memo, and Sandwich, Falmouth, and Truro are still at $15 a day. Again, Sandwich, Falmouth, and Truro are still at $15. Most Mid-Cape towns charge $70 to $75 for a weekly pass, and a seasonal non-resident pass is $300. So after the Recreation Committee studied this issue, they recommended to the Board of Selectmen that you consider an increase in these fees in order to simplify the discussion, we've broken them down. But basically, these are the fees that we presently have been charging for the last 10 years, and we're proposing this increase in fees. Um, with this increase, we anticipate generating in the area of $200,000. If the daily pass were to increase from $15 to $20, taking the actual daily passes sold over the last five years and averaging out the number we will have sold 24,762 passes and with that five dollar increase we would generate approximately one hundred and twenty four thousand dollars the recreation commission recommends this increase for a weekend and holiday pass it was considered if we should go up it was decided no, it should remain the same at $20 and not do the 25 like other towns who charge more for weekend and holidays. For a weekly pass, over the last five years, the average sold were $335. We're recommending a $5 increase only to $75 because other towns charge between $70 and $75 for a weekly pass, and this increase would generate $1,675. The Recreation Commission recommends this increase. And finally, for a seasonal pass, over the last five years, 
we sell an average of 133 seasonal passes to non-residents. <coughs> these are non-resident passes. That 133 going up to $250 would be a $75 increase and would generate approximately $10,000 more in annual revenue. The, Re the Recreation Commission recommends this as well. These are the recommendations. We have not added um, the residential pass, which has been at $35 for 10 years. Um, though I did send and, and shared and was asked to share the information with the board that on average we sell 8,375 residential passes on a daily basis, on an annual basis. And of that 875, if we went up $5, we would generate another $42,000, which would be just about the amount that our expenses have gone up over the last 10 years. But that is not on the table tonight. From the legal ed, just these three non-resident categories are on the, for your consideration. Any questions? So I just want to clarify. So the resident sticker that was advertised is not... In not case you chose to take it up tonight, it was not the recommendation <coughs> of the Recreation Commission, but they said we should add it for your information. It was not put in to the legal ad. It was just informational. If it comes up okay. maybe next year, okay. then at least you have that information to consider. Great. And um, we don't have a policy um, with recreation in terms of the percentage. Um, percentage? Yeah. Um, I noticed that like the non resident seasonal pass is a, is a large percentage increase. I know for golf, we have a policy that we don't increase um, fees over 5%. Not that I'm aware of. That 5% <coughs> excuse me, Madam Chair was imposed by town meeting. For all fees, sir? No, for golf. For golf. But it wasn't our policy, it was a vote at a town meeting. Oh, okay. It was like, oh, yeah. no, 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 I just wanted to make sure because I had the problem. I'm out of track. All right, so we will go to the public first. Before we go to the public, the legal, legal notice includes the resident seasonal sticker. I got it right here. You can look at it. Yeah, but you can choose not to vote on it. It just had to be advertised in case you made the decision to vote on it, but hmm. we didn't think you would. So is it not being recommended to us, or can we choose not to vote on it? Because there's a difference in my mind. Um, both. <laughs> Mr. Zemanski? <laughs> the meeting minutes that I remember, it was um, recommended, but then the discussion was had that over a thousand residents revenues that will be available to the town. <laughs> okay, I'm not trying to be. No, I, I, I'm not see, trying I to trade between them. I get it. I got that. Okay. So we have new revenues, which will be helpful as we go through some other fees. Uh, so, are you, you're telling me that the beach fees increases are going to the recreation budget? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that the recreation committee, uh, the recreation budget is from the beach fees on an annual basis is about two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, and that money has been the same. It continues to be recommended as the same in 2019, and it's been the same amount of money for the last seven or eight years. So, what will happen to these this fee increase? They'll be used to offset as is seen fit by the town administration other expenses which could be park oriented, which could be conservation oriented, could be recreation oriented. We haven't requested these money because they're not here to request yet. So the budgets are already in and been requested so I couldn't ask for an increase of something I didn't know we had money for. And we haven't asked for these fee increases so, so I what? Didn't. So what is the purpose? So, of so essentially, so the budget, our end of the budget had been crafted and things uh, were increasingly very difficult to finance. We have a significant amount of capital repair we're doing. We're looking at different options for care and upkeep of the infrastructure related to the beach. There's the cost of the minimum wage that has gone up. So all of these pressures we were trying to accommodate within the regular budget process. And it was mentioned at the time that it had been many years since these particular fees were looked at, and if we were going to try to do something uh, more robust and address some of the cost centers associated with running the recreational operation, now would be the time actually to put that in front of you before the beach season. So we could have allowed it to go by, the year go by, we would have struggled along and deferred a few things and, and made do with what we had, but there was an opportunity to put this in front of the board, and it would be available 
for next year to actually work on something more productive. I mean, one of the strategies we have is, as you know, the uh, cost of labor cons consistently tries to grow. There are some options related to outsourcing. You might look at the contracts. We would need to pay vendors to do certain things. Wouldn't but, those get paid out of the recreation budget? Well, in this particular case, this, this money that comes in comes in as a receipt to us. As a, I think they're offset receipts. No, these receipts go into the general fund. In the general fund. So eventually they'll come back to us in the general fund. But we, we didn't anticipate any budgetary issues that are in front of you with this money in mind. So, but, but if we had missed this opportunity, we would have gone a whole other year without having any additional revenue opportunity. I just uh, heard of this tonight, so, uh, but I walk Seagull Beach nearly every day, uh, winter, summer. I can understand why dentists can charge $25, $30. They do a magnificent job and give you the beach clean. I think Seagull Beach is a travesty, and if some of this money can go to improve that, then you have the right to charge the funds. But if you're not going to use any of this money to clean, uh, to clean up Seagull Beach, I would vote against it. This is a public hearing. If you could please identify yourself here. David Bradbury, 9 Berwick Road, West Yarmouth. Thank you. Full time resident. Okay. Anybody else would like to speak on this particular hearing? Um, just for the record, so everybody knows, we um, usually have two. Uh, this is our first hearing. Typically, we have two hearings, so after we take comments and questions from the board tonight, we will continue this to the next meeting. We, we try not to vote on it in one in one time because oftentimes this is the first time people have heard about it, and sometimes people want to have a comment after they've heard the presentation. So, so with that, we'll start with board Mark. I think Pat, you were pointing out that the second public hearing is what February 13th. Is that correct? It? So February 13th at six o'clock. Um, actually, that might end up being in the back of town hall. Really? Yeah, actually, the, the renovation work is progressing at a pretty good pace, and there is an outside chance of being back next week, but more than likely the 13th for sure. Well, that requires me to advertise the second hearing because I advertised it at the broad space. That's a good point. So, <laughs> did you advertise this one and the second one? I was trying to save money, so I advertised both <laughs> at the same time. Oh. Well, I think as long as we put a notification here. Mm -hmm. I think we've done that. Whatever's before. necessary. Yeah, it's yeah. seventy five hundred dollars so That's what it costs. That's why we're being uh, oh, yeah. we need to know. The the other question I had is just understanding the amount of revenue that's generated by these proposed increases. Is, am I correct in understanding that the cost of added services is the forty two thousand dollar number that's on this memo that we have? That's additional services over the last five years that we've absorbed in the budget with a budget increase that we're asking for more revenues. And so the amount of revenue that's being generated by these things again is what? 175000 So that's well in excess of this particular number. Yes. Um, are there any, I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic with this gentleman's point of view on making sure that any of the increases go back to maintenance and taking care of the beaches. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very disappointed that um, the gentleman feels that it's a travesty. It's a strong word. Um, we don't rake the beaches at this time of year, um, as we have in the summer, because um, the sand is frozen, it'll, it'll affect the machine, but also um, we're restricted, unlike some others, of re removing um, seaweed and other material from the beach because of the national and federally protected shorebird program. So. I will personally walk Seagull Beach tomorrow morning and find out how that interpretation came. But we certainly will put money back in, and we have been doing uh, repairs of uh, um, storm fences. We've been putting up signs because people have been climbing in the dunes. We have been at the beach three or four days a week making sure the trash is still being picked up in that area on a daily basis. Um, the restrooms are closed, but uh, we're doing our best to uh, keep it uh, maintained. And I. I would embarrassed to hear such a statement because normally we only hear good things about the quality of our beaches so I'll make sure even in January they need to be as clean as they are in July so we'll be back there making sure that happens. Thank you. 
Um, I appreciate your candor, Pat, but notwithstanding that, it seems like this is just a revenue raising request. There was probably $42,000 in hard expenses that can be justified. <clears throat> and $175,000 being sought by the fee increases for a difference of approximately $133,000. Uh, you know, user fees are typically fees imposed for those that use a, a particular a facility or department um, to kind of defray some of the expenses of that department, um, but not all of the expenses of the department. As I understand, this money goes back into the general fund. Always has to. And it will not be earmarked uh, especially for any beach improvements or anything like that. It would become, if not utilized, free cash, and then would be earmarked by the town administration as a free cash grant for the following year until the revenues were considered to be um, that which could be dependent upon, and then it could be added to the regular budget. So, if I may, so everybody's aware that. There's a lot of capital needs in front of the town, and the beaches are of no different. There's significant infrastructure work that needs to be done. There's ongoing annual work that needs to be done. So one of the things that could be done, as the revenue comes in at that dollar value, it can become available next year in free cash, and we can establish a uh, beach and recreation capital stabilization fund. Because one of the challenges in front of us is, with all of the other things that are well documented that are in front of us, all these other smaller items, they compete for an ever-shrinking pool of money. But we're trying to take steps now to build stabilization accounts that can be available in future time when projects are ready to go, when it's time to do bathroom facilities and construction <coughs> facilities over, when we need to do beach nourishment. All of these are asks that are building that we haven't put in front of you because there's only so much bandwidth right now to put capital asks in front of you. But Make no mistake about it, every day that goes by, the infrastructure on our beach is decaying and we don't have a, a dedicated revenue stream. So so right now I can't I don't have any specific project in mind, but certainly when the money becomes available, we could put in front of you next year a free cash ask in front of town meeting that could go into a stabilization account to begin someday when we have to do significant upgrades. Well do respect the for right now there is no Beach and Recreation Stabilization Account. Right. Number two, if I go to the Board of Selectmen, that money could go anywhere. It's going into the general budget. It's going to pop up in the form of free cash. It could go to police. It could go to fire. It could go if, anywhere. If you wanted it to do that, to go to town meeting. Right? right. And the third thing is, I think it's a question of the cart and the horse. You can say, well, we raise the money and then maybe we can have a stabilization account. It seems to me that, that things are backward here. Um, the account, and I don't see, <clears throat> I like to see facts, I like to see numbers, I like to see projects, projections, estimates. This thing is too um, vague for me that we, we got projects, I'm <coughs> projects. So let's raise fees and then maybe later we can create a stabilization account that we can put money into. To me, this is, this is, if this isn't a tax, it's at least the first cousin to a tax. Um, when you're raising funds, you know, under the auspices of a user fee, you're just pouring them into a general fund where they can go anywhere. It seems to me the, the concept, the traditional concept of, of a user fee has been vastly expanded. Um, so that it, it approximates more a tax than the user fee. But I'm not the biggest advocate of the increasing use of these anyway. I mean, that's, that's well known. Um, but maybe that's what the slogan of Yarmouth within reach is about, you know, within reach of your wallet. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, uh, you know, I'm really bothered by the lack of specificity of these, um, <clears throat> so, you know, these, these capitalized. And, and again, Pat, I really do appreciate you know, being very uh, straightforward about no money and what's going on here, um, what the general purposes are, but... Um, Here's a, a list of capital projects that are uh, proposed, proposed going forward that are on the 10-year uh, capital project uh, plan. 
that uh, include beach improvements and that um, there are a number of projects that have been deferred because of other needs. So if I'm not the one that sets those priorities, I put them forward for the administration and the board to set. But if you were looking for a reference, uh, I have some projects on that list as well as uh, Mr. Van Holm in Natural Resources and, and because he does so much work on the, as well. So I appreciate it, you and you being protected from the taxpayers and you've always said that fees are just another form of taxation and you've always stood by that and I would insult you by saying that I don't agree uh, or that this isn't could be interpreted that way but there are projects. Ten years ago we suggested projects and then we hoped to get the money but the times have changed so now we need to have the money in the bank before we're given money for a project. So I can't propose a project until I know the money is available. And these numbers that I've given you are just proposals and I don't know what the real money will be so until next capital budget round I don't know what I'll be able to ask for because I might only make 120 and I only say I because it's a department I'm overseeing but we might only clear 120,000 but if we had it on for 150 and we already committed how do we make up that shortfall? We're being frugal based on your directives and be careful with the money so we're trying to make it before we spend it instead of anticipating we're going to make it and then fall short because there's no shortfalls allowed in the with all due respect, and I don't mean to argue, but I think the project has got to be defined first. And then the anticipated cost of the project becomes second. And then the funding is last. I think this is totally convoluted. Um, but notwithstanding that, you probably have others that are more sympathetic than I am. I went from sympathetic to norm. Oh. <laughs> 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 it was a 50-50 shot over there. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> about, uh, um, yeah, I think uh, to, to expand you know, perhaps on uh, what Mike is, is talking about, I think it's important for us to have a clear picture of what our capital needs are. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think the first step might be to look back, you know, the last five years to ten years, and we'll, let's let's uh, get out on paper what we spent from a capital perspective, so that we can uh, really uh, get the details on, on what we need in order to operate, and and as well uh, project what unusual items might be uh, required in the future that might not be reflected in that five or ten year history. But I, I think it is important that we identify the full picture of uh, capital as well as operating expenses. So I think you, you identify, I have some additional questions on the operating expenses, but you, you have identified those, but I think the missing part that uh, you know, Mike alluded to was the, uh, the capital, and it's probably even more significant. Uh, so, heretofore, I suppose we've been funding the capital needs for our beaches out of the general fund. Uh, out of, uh, I don't recall a lot of free cash grants, uh, but they may well have been some. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we need to have that before we can really make a decision on, on how to accommodate this. Um, the, the other concept that Dan was talking about in terms of a capital fund, I think it makes a lot more sense to me. I believe that Dennis <coughs> does that currently. Does. I believe we have a capital fund established. We might look to, you know, certainly their beaches are different, uh, um, but we might look to their experience with regard to their spending as well as um, uh, what kind of capital fund they've accumulated and how and, and what the structure of that is in order to come up with a recommendation on how to handle that uh, here. But I think we certainly have some other examples uh, in, in the area. Um, I am, it seems to me the last time we talked about fees on beaches, <coughs> it was pointed out to me that uh, the fees are parking fees. That's correct. Yeah. But the details that we're referring to are these parking-related expenses. 
only a few. The decision to call a fee a parking fee was uh, the recommendation of town council based on um, liability issues. If you say that your fees pay for lifeguards, and then you're providing lifeguards and something happens, it opens you up to uh, a can of worms that if you say your parking, your fee is for parking, then it's just for parking. So on, the, on recommendation the, of town council, that concept was brought forth, and we've been following that for the no, a number of years. Okay, but it is charged by vehicle. That's correct. It's not charged by user. That's correct. And I guess that's that's another issue I have with the expenses <coughs> is that the expenses are incurred with regard to all the users of the beach, which includes a lot of walking activity. Yes. That, uh, in theory, uh, to some degree, uh, some amount of our beach activity, and I don't know what it is, is walking activity that is, in, in effect, funded out of taxes, or so the people that walk in claim. Uh, and I'm not sure how we deal with that, but I, I, I'm, you know, a little bit uncomfortable just saying, oh, well, we're, we're going to charge higher, higher parking fees because the use of our beaches has expanded when part of that use is not for parking, uh, not related to the people that are actually parking. So, you know, uh, do we have some idea of the breakdown of, of beachgoers between people that come in in vehicles and people that walk to the beach? Absolutely. And use facilities and All of the hotels along the strip have capacities and those people walk upon and down the beach. People enter at the red jacket and go down to the vest river and come back. All of those people who want to stop and use restrooms or need a band-aid from a lifeguard or decide to stop and get a soda at the vest river <coughs> concession. Um, we have no way of counting how many of those are walkers and how many have parked. I can tell you how many parked cars we have. I can tell you what days we've closed. I can tell you the number of tickets we sold. But I can't tell you with all the different access points how people access the beach. It's just, and in order to create that, we'd have to fence and I'm gate not, our I'm beach not, way. I'm not suggesting that. Oh, I know you're not, but I'm saying that's the only way I could give you a number. And, and I guess that, that goes more to my point in terms of you know, your example of people that are staying at Red Jacket. Well, uh, those folks are presumably non-residents, uh, visitors in the area. Um, it's Red Jacket that is really paying the taxes that subsidize their their uh, guests' use of the beach. So, uh, <coughs> Except, Norm, that Red Jacket has their own beach. They do? I, I think they in do. terms of the walking traffic, and I've, I've been living here 40 years on the, on the south side of the Cape. I think the private, the private beaches are the ones that get the flow from the public beaches, not vice versa. If somebody's renting one of these high-priced motel rooms at Blue Water, a place like that, they're not going to go to the public beaches. They're more than happy being on the private beaches. It's the people mm -hmm. on the public beaches that take their walks back and forth. Um, and sometimes you get complaints from the people who own <laughs> the private beaches that people come to the public beaches and use those beaches, you know, those beach areas. But the other thing I can tell you is, in all the years I've been going there, I see very few with people that are walking in, most everybody that goes into Smuggler's Beach, where I go, beaches like that, or the Residence Beach, they're, right, they're in the car. People I, don't I, walk. I disagree with that. I, no. I, I, I've Shoot seen them down down north. an awful lot of people <laughs> walking in with, with chairs in hand and, and so forth. Uh, you know, and, uh, but whether it is or isn't, the, the point is that you know, we're equating an increase in expenses for use of the beach and for upkeep of the beach and, uh, to what is needed for fees. I'm not sure that that's that it's a one-on-one -on -one type of relationship. Um, I do think that we need to be careful uh, to make sure that we have sufficient money available for capital spending in particular. And, uh, and I think we need to identify where we're going and what what this
store that we have spent, so we have something more to get to this week. I'll have that back for you at the next meeting. Uh, Ten years back sufficient? I used a lot of this. If you have it, I mean, you know, I, I was... Well, it's in the records. It's that range. I mean, you, the, the further back you go, the more likely it is that you're going to come across projects that are uh, uh, not just, you know, uh, something that, that pops... Or you're, you're going to come across something that pops up just once in a while. That's right. and, and a septic so system issue that costs thousands of dollars, a right. failed yeah. sidewalk for 10. Right. And, and um, would you like recommendations such as a reserve for appropriation or other ways of handling that capital reserve fund? Or are we, I leave that up. I think if you could put that together so that we can think options understand for that? what the options are, I think that would be helpful. I'd be happy to do that for you for the next meeting. If I may, uh, to the chair, uh, like as a, for instance, uh, if we had a fund available to tap into, we're facing maybe $70,000 worth of damage done to uh, Bass Hole Boardwalk and another $50,000 or so gone to the Taylor Gray Fund. Right now, uh, it's unclear to us that uh, Taylor Gray has no insurance on it, but the other one, <coughs> the insurance company, as you can imagine, they took a lot of beatings uh, in the last few weeks and they haven't really been amenable yet to uh, our price tag for repair. Potentially FEMA eligible. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we're focused on trying to get that boardwalk prepared so it's available this summer and we need to identify some money that we presently have in here, Mark, to do that to pay for it ahead of time. And the last thing we want to do is have public facilities languish in an unrepaired status. And I do know from some of the walk-arounds of the beach facilities, there's some revetment projects that have been put back and not funded, and uh, we've got some sloughing in some areas that needs to be addressed. So we'll have a list of projects that we so desire at the next hearing meeting. Um, but again, the idea behind putting this in front of you tonight was 2018, we we're going to, much like the parks and rec master plan, we we're going to use this year to <coughs> identify those shortcomings at the beach infrastructure and, and hopefully identify a path going forward, how it can sustain itself. And Selectman Holtman has, uh, has been instrumental in getting us a, uh, to the point where we have a contract on restoration of uh, the bass hole seagrass uh, situation that we have there and there's also on, uh, a free cash consideration that believe there's some invasive, invasive species removals. These are things that we're hitting periodically once every few years but in reality you need to have a maintenance program on those to keep them to keep all that work back uh, so we don't go in these you know cycles around and around and around but we'll put all that in front of you next uh, next year. Don't we have insurance in the board books? Well, so the insurance company is kind of blocking at it, calling it uh, a, uh, potentially a, uh, a situation that they shouldn't be liable for that because of, uh, I suppose it wasn't like normal wear and tear, it was something really abnormal. I think what they're hoping for is a FEMA bailout on uh, the whole situation. But the, sh the, the short term problem for us is we've got to fix it so that it's open uh, for the tourist season. And, uh, and all the planks are going in. Many of them. Uh, all the planks are in some place. Assholes. The planks are all, all, none of the planks are damaged. So it's side railing at the end. It's just railing some things, and then the back the right observation yeah. dock at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Footings are all damaged. But we don't really, I mean, just to be clear on the record, we don't know whether the insurance company is going to pay for that damage. We're not sure yet. And we're not sure yet whether FEMA is going to give us some money. We are assembling the paperwork. For we're still waiting for the 2014 storm FEMA money from the <laughs> <laughs> Turn it down. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, I'm not holding my breath for it. <laughs> okay, you want to put you on the phone? No. Yeah. Um, I think you can probably see where this is going, so I'll spare you my comments. Thank you. Uh, the only question I have is can, can you address the status of the Englewood parking? Is, it, is there any change proposed? At this point in time, we're looking at all of our um, <coughs> operations on the beach. I've been asked to evaluate all of our beach operations to bring forward how our operations differ and how changing things might impact fee generation to generate revenues for making improvements and that are needed because so many things haven't been done. Um, we'll be looking at all the parking lots and how they manage those that are charged for and those that are open and free. We'll be looking at uh, the hours of operations that we have compared to um, other beaches. We'll be looking at um, how we pay for and manage our um, restroom cleaning, our trash 
and everything that we've just taken for granted is what we do to see if there's efficiencies that might be um, worth bringing to the board. At this point, I don't have any decision. I'm just collecting information for you to look at. And in there will be how many spaces are directly adjacent to beachfronts that do not require a resident sticker or have any monitoring at all. And there's 120 directly in beaches named parking lots and another 80 adjacent that aren't in named parking lots that you might consider um, looking at as because we still collect trash there, we still paint the lines there, we still provide porta johns if we don't provide restrooms, mm -hmm. and we provide services even at these free areas that over the years have cost. So but that's will be far from I'm just gonna get all the, the information you've requested and I'll bring it forward to Mr. Kanapik and he can decide if he wants to bring it to you or if it's not the right time. Nothing proposed for the coming fiscal year, though, is that correct? This summer, at least? No, well, I might say that there is actually, not related to the parking lot itself, but the uh, there will be one article that will reverse a 1994 bylaw related to parking in various side streets along Englewood. Thank you. So we're trying to correct that. We've had a couple of, uh, I don't know, two or three or four meetings with the neighborhood to try to uh, find what is the best uh, parking signage needed for the side streets along the way and I believe that uh, in order to get to where we want to go we have to uh, amend the bylaws through the town meeting to address the 1994 uh, signage that essentially allowed only truck and trailer parking that the neighborhood has found to be really problematic when we put the signs back up to enforce parking in the past summer. Mm -hmm. So that will be an article for the issue. I'd like a yes or no answer to the following question. Are there any parking fees scheduled for the Englewood Beach no. parking lot? Thank you. I like that yes or no uh, what? It's really kind of easy. Um, I guess my, my question was, uh, you know, you're saying that we all feel that the fees should be directly related to the service. And to Mr. Bradbury's point about the beach, I think that you've made a lot of progress. I know in the last year you've done a lot of raking, um, you've worked with the unions to get Saturday trash pickup. It, I think that you've come a long way, and they're, they're looking really good in comparison to the past. But, you know, I always think about investment and return and tourism and bringing people to our community and striving to be like Dennis and be, you know Dave Dennis is able to charge those rates because people want to go there so you know when I think about fees if we ever had any extra money not that it's extra money but it seems that it would be what can we use that money to invest in to create a better product and to create um, something and, and other than capital just just um, something that we can do to, to bring more people to our beaches. Um, some people want that, some people don't. Um, but there's got to be things that we've, we've always put off and we've struggled, struggled with. Um, I would just love to hear your ideas that um, perhaps we don't raise them as much as um, proposed. The 175,000 um, that these fees generated, did that include the residential? Uh, ticket no, so that's without it. So the 133 that Mr. Stone spoke about would be without that. Yes, the uh, five dollar increase on the daily pass would generate um, as, as in the memo uh, 124 thousand dollars. The five dollar increase in the weekly pass would uh, generate uh, two thousand dollars, and the uh, 75 dollar increase in the uh, seasonal pass would generate uh, ten thousand dollars. Well, I guess from, from my perspective, I you know, we've tried to keep fees within a certain percentage. I think that that's a big percentage, the, the non-resident seasonal pass. So, I mean, I'd like to see them somewhere around no more than 5% increase. Um, I think that that is more than sufficient in a year's time. A 5% increase on a $15 fee will be a dollar. And then our operations will then be dealing with one dollar bills. The problem that we have is we wait a really long time, <coughs> and um, I know. you know, then we have these significant price changes. And in terms of percentages, 
I think, you know, without belating this, because I, I know where we are quickly, um, we have some restrooms that we need to make some choices on. If what we're going to do with these restrooms, if we're going to provide porcelain, or are we going to go in another direction, or, you know, all those different reasons which I don't have to draw. So there's restroom issues that need to be addressed. There's um, efficiency of beach cleaning and trash pickup that needs to be looked at. There's the automation of the beach collection system so that cash is no longer handled at the beaches and we move into a, um, the next generation of collections that will keep people safe and, and service our community, but that's an infrastructure improvement that will require some significant money, including better connectivity so that we can do swipe cards and not be dealing with cash. We'll be dealing with other I things. think those are all great, and I would love to see that in conjunction. Well, that's what you just room. asked me to do, I thought. I'm sorry. Well, I, I mean for the next meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I think that in, in terms of, of being able to quantify the need, I want to see the benefit. Got it. Is what, I'm, is what I'm saying. Not only for capital, but for short-term expenses that, that makes the experience better. Fans on a weekly basis. <clears throat> like the movies that we've done at night for free for the community and some of the other things we've done, those, I mean, those are things we've done. So that kind of thing, short term, non infrastructure, programmatic things to improve the beach experience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And propose things that, you know, that, that justify these increases mm -hmm. that you can continue to do or add. So with that, um, we'll have a motion to continue to February 13th. So Is there a second? Good. Is there any other discussion on this item? Mm -hmm. so All those in favor? Uh -huh. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. The next item on the agenda is the Chamber of Commerce Marketing presentation. <laughs>
report, the fourth quarter report that outlined the marketing plan, the um, data that we found that justified why we were doing specific marketing strategies. So I hope that you were able to review that because it's a very detailed, detailed and comprehensive report that we submit to the um, Community and Economic Development Department. Um, this evening, when we realized that we would not be able to show that presentation, we created just a quick nine-minute presentation that has all of the information that is in your packet that was presented earlier to you. Um, so Ashley is just going to um, introduce the presentation to you. Sure. So just want to mention that the original presentation is about 25 minutes. <laughs> so we know that we didn't have the time for that tonight. We just wanted to um, let that down. And but Mary Excuse mentioned. Me. I can't hear you because the door is open. And I was wondering if you could shut the door. We can shut the door. It will get very, very hot. So I think we're better. It does turn the door. There is a
These campaigns are intended to drive traffic to our website. Email marketing has many benefits, including real-time messaging, trackable user engagement, and an engaged recipient pool. Through the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce, we were able to send a stay and play getaway to their tourism email list, which had 39,342 recipients. Of those, we had an 18% open rate and a 35.7% click rate. The success of this campaign additionally resulted in our email leads growing by 2,672 units. Traditional marketing is a large category encompassing print ads, rap cards, photo and video, radio, and trade shows. A rap card is a great piece of marketing used to promote signature events here in Yarmouth. We designed two different rap cards covering a half a year at a time. We hired a professional photographer to document several of Yarmouth's signature events. These photos are hosted on our website and used for marketing purposes. Additionally, we were able to purchase a drawing video that showcases the beautiful scenery in Yarmouth, which we use in our visitor center and as a marketing tool. We worked with several different print publications to promote Yarmouth as a destination. We continued contracting with the Boston Herald for a multi-page advertorial with a print readership of approximately 265,000 and a combined Twitter and Facebook following of 210,000. We published an events calendar in the Cape Cod Summer Times magazine, coupled with an e-blast, which targeted 25,000 households. We secured a full-page ad promoting Yarmouth as a four-season destination in the Cape Cod Travel Guide, which prints 150,000 copies. For our partnership with Boston Globe, we were able to receive a free Boston Globe Sunday Travel Magazine ad, which we used to promote spring getaway activities. We printed a full back page of the registered newspaper quarterly throughout the year, and also placed a full-page ad in the Yarmouth Town Handbook. As part of a multimedia campaign, we contract with iHeartRadio out of Providence. With this three-week campaign, we have 33 15-second terrestrial ads on four stations. Additionally, they run 60 streaming ads on all four stations, host four banner ads during the campaign, and offer one homepage takeover. We participated in several trade shows, including the Boston Globe Travel Show, the Portland Golf Show, and the National Golf Expo in Boston. Under the visitor services portion of the contract, we focused on providing a comprehensive concierge guide, training for hospitality staff, and participating in the Sand Sculpture Trail. Starting in April, we design and print 5,000 copies of each edition of our concierge guide. This guide consists of activities available in Yarmouth during that time period. The Yarmouth Chamber of Commerce distributes these to local restaurants, hotels, inns and other high traffic areas like our libraries and the cultural center of Cape Cod. In partnership with the Steamship Authority, we planned and executed our first Mid-Cape Tourism Summit, positioned to be an annual event. While Yarmouth is full of rich history, signature events, and exciting places to visit, oftentimes our frontline staff are not aware of all that we have to offer. This event was a way to educate those who have the first touch point with a guest. In early June, for the first time, the Yarmouth Chamber of Commerce in partnership with Hello Summer J1 program, hosted a J1 orientation dinner. The dinner was intended to welcome J1s to Yarmouth and inform them of some of the day-to-day -day cultural differences that will make their experience educational and fun. A sand sculpture was built and displayed at the Yarmouth Chamber of Commerce building and was a dedication to the arts. Yarmouth has a lot to offer through arts and culture, and this sculpture was a physical representation and celebration of that. With 13,539 visitors coming to our visitor center this past summer, we feel we made a significant impact on raising awareness of our town's art and culture. <coughs> our final section of the contract focuses on event coordination. Under this section, we allocated funds for public enhancements to the town of Yarmouth, as well as several events, including the Trolley Tour Taste of Yarmouth, the Yarmouth Port Christmas Stroll, the annual Community Cleanup Day, and the Summer Concert Series are crucial to improving and enhancing the public spaces in our town for all to enjoy. In partnership with the Yarmouth Rotary, Community Connections, and approximately 20 volunteers, fall and holiday decorations were installed at key locations in Yarmouth. The owner of the vacant wings building was receptive to the idea of enhancing his building in the spring of 2017. With representatives from the Cultural Center of Cape Cod, we installed 13 visual art banners in the window panes which were on display from June to Labor Day weekend. The third annual Trolley Tour Taste of Yarmouth was a very successful event. Through feedback from business surveys, we decided to make a few changes in the third year, including minimizing the room and changing the time of the event. These changes were well received by both the attendees and the businesses. 
We had approximately 225 attendees and sold out two weeks before the event. We coordinated the Yarmouth Park Christmas Stroll in 2016 in partnership with the Historical Society of Old Yarmouth. By adding a few new entertainment pieces and locations, we were able to increase the family-friendly activities. The event was well attended and ended with a tree lighting and caroling. The Yarmouth Chamber of Commerce worked in partnership with several town departments to execute the second annual Community Cleanup Day. Through this collaboration, we were able to triple the number of volunteers from the first year. Each attendee cleaned designated areas of Yarmouth from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and then were invited back to the town hall for an appreciation lunch with awards. Providing free community events is an excellent way to build community pride. Through the summer concert series, we were able to provide five free concerts in the month of August for anyone to attend. These concerts are held at Parker's River Beach every Monday night at 6 p.m. When one year ends, the next begins. As we move into the spring shoulder season, we are working on several marketing campaigns, including our Facebook ad campaign and online display campaign. We have also contracted with the Boston Herald and WCVB to expand our reach through video campaigns and email marketing. We will be attending the Boston Globe Travel Show in February. The Yarmouth Chamber of Commerce is always working on new projects to ensure that Yarmouth is at the forefront of travel. That was great. different 
uh, functions that they could have at that restaurant to bring more awareness of the course. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. When are the golf shows? Uh, one is the third week of February and one's first, week first March. March. Okay. And so they're they're early. They're in time for people to plan to oh, promote uh, mm -hmm. spring activity, which. <coughs> You know, if you go to Boston or Portland, uh, there's a lot of courses that are still closed, whereas mm -hmm. here, uh, we may have at least basketball, <coughs> if not others. Uh, so it really is, uh, you know, I think it's an opportunity that, that uh, we need to promote more. So we also go to the Boston Globe Trials show February 9th, 10th, and 11th. And that, although <coughs> it's specifically a golf show, we do promote the courses there as well and some giveaways. Um, so we can set up those. Thank you. You mentioned <clears throat> that one of the things you do is you partake in the um, Herald Marketing video. Can you explain to me a little bit more about what's entailed with that? So we haven't done a Herald Marketing video yet. We, that'll be in this contract here. Um, but what we have contracted with them in the past is an advertorial. So it's basically shared ad space for different businesses. And once they buy into that ad space, they'll be mentioned in an editorial piece of the ad. It spreads across three, about three pages of the, um, there's a section of the Boston Herald, the uh, road trip takeover. It will be featured in that. In the last two years, I believe it was published both times in June and focused on the summer celebration, um, as announcing for that, the Sands Culture Trail, some other events that might have been happening around that time, mentions of the summer concert series. And then uh, we also, it mentions hotels and restaurants and other people who buy into the um, advertorial piece itself. Uh, the Boston Herald video is a new opportunity that was presented to me by the representative of the Herald. And basically it's a, for fairly low cost, it's under $1,000, they'll execute a, I believe it's a 15 second video of our choosing whatever content we'd like on it. Once that's purchased, they'll also host that video on the Herald site for a designated period of time, and then we own the video afterwards. So we can host it on YouTube, we can put it on our website, we can use it for marketing purposes in the future. Right now, we are waiting to get final word on how we'll move forward on some pending items, so we haven't determined what the content will be of that video, but it could be anywhere from an event to just a <coughs> brief overview of the town, something about the beaches. It could really be anything um, and we're sort of working on those details right now. Well, what does your radio marketing consist of? Do you just <clears throat> kind of have paid ads, one-time shots on the radio, or do you ever interview, you know, one of the talk shows and talk about the chamber or things like that? So we've gone on radio shows before when it's a specific purpose, if we're promoting a specific event, never just to talk about Yarmouth as a tourism destination. Um, I. I think it's difficult for people you know, don't necessarily want to bring that on. It's very specific. They like to trade with ticket giveaways or things like that. We do contract with our Heart Radio out of Providence. Um, it's cheaper than Boston and it's off Cape, so we don't want to necessarily uh, saturate the Cape market since people are already here. We're looking to hit people who aren't here that are drivable distance to Cape. So we, um, it's more affordable, which is why we go through Providence and. Through that uh, relationship, we've been able to tr uh, we buy three weeks and we get two weeks. So we end up uh, receiving more for the dollar um, by doing it with them. And it's a multi-touch radio. So through iHeartRadio, they have terrestrial ads, which is like a regular radio that you'll hear in your car. And then they have the streaming ads, which if somebody's listening to iHeartRadio on their computer, on their phone, something like that, they'll hear the ads through that. They also have website, which we do a homepage takeover of. So we have banner ads and click ads that'll drive traffic to our website. Um, so it's sort of a multi-level campaign, even though it's you know, it's traditional radio, but there's extra pieces that go into the contract. And what about in the greater New York area? There's, there's always been a lot of tourism, and I'm not talking about the city per se, but in the in Rockland County, Westchester, in the New Jersey area, do you do much to draw that market? I mean. The reason I say that is now Jet Blue, as you know, is flying daily in season out of the greater New York area. They're bringing an awful lot of people. The flights are, are very, um, very heavily booked. So I don't, in my time with the Chamber, we have not done anything in that area, but it's definitely worth a look. Um, it's always tough to stretch the dollar and, you know, how do we um, allocate X amount of dollars, um, but I think it's definitely something that we can do. 
Um, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to applaud you for all the work that you do for the community. You're incredibly resourceful, um, and I think you do a wonderful job. And uh, I very much appreciate uh, all the hard work that, that you do for the town. Um, every time I'm in town hall, I usually see one of you in there helping us out on various committees and other things. And I think um, and I very much appreciate it. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Um, well, my question is, how can we help you um, in terms of partnering and making sure that uh, you're able to help you reach your goals? I think we're very successful right now being able to partner with Parks and Rec, um, working with Jeff Colby on the cleanup day. Um, the town is extremely supportive on the events that we've taken on in the last two years. So thank you for acknowledging that, but I think we have a great partnership with the town departments right now and always willing to work together. So I appreciate that, Karen Green. I applaud her for the work that she um, does with the chamber on so many different projects. Um, so thank you. Thank you. To look through the packet, this was a this was a condensed version. But looking at all the events that you guys do throughout the year, um, or your help with, it's just amazing. And I know every year it's the issue du jour. And last year you advocated very much for the Route Six um, rest area, and I know we're making progress on that. But um, there's just so many fronts that you assist uh, um, our community on. It's very much appreciated. And if I can do, just give you an update sure. on that, the county uh, has agreed to let us manage the Route 6 Visitor Center again this year uh, and hopefully help us supplement the rest of the budget because if you were awarded a $40,000 grant and we only spent 18000 of it to fund the entire operations of the rest of it last year. So we will open on Memorial Day. We tracked over 90,000 people that came through that rest area. Last year we actually the county put door counters on the restroom so that only comes with the door opening and one person walking in, not the three that followed mom. <laughs> so we expect that the numbers are much higher than that. So we're very proud that we have been able to secure that again for this year for our businesses. Well, thanks for your hard work.
Too many items, too many big items. Thank you, everybody. The next item on our agenda is the recognition of the master plan update for the value of the tax strong and Abel Dots, Landscott, architect Michael Dodson are joining me this evening from CDM Smith. Uh, CDM Smith was hired by the town of Yarmouth in 2008 to do a master plan of uh, the two larger parks in town, Flash Pond and Sandy Pond. After the addition of the Cape Cod Rail Trail, uh, the Community Preservation Group back in 2014 funded a secondary <laughs> update to that plan, including uh, the master um, plan for um, old townhouse known as Homer Park, so that we could see the impacts of both uh, economic development and usage-wise of that add-in of the rail trail that connects all three of those parks. Tonight, um, even though it was started in 2014, we um, had uh, numerous public meetings with uh, local groups of interest that utilize the parks, uh, children's programs, sport and non-sport, uh, adult programs, uh, local charter schools who don't have their own field facilities and utilize these down fields for their sports programs, including tennis, um, as well as quadrangle field programs. And um, we found this fun group called Pickleball, that um, came about. Everyone here who's here for pickleball, please raise your hand so the selectmen know you're here. Thank you very much for that. They've been waiting to talk to you. I told them that public comment was earlier. So they wanted you to see them and hear them in their visual voices. So um, what we did was um, look at the usage of the parks putting in some new amenities such as pickleball courts and to look at uh, the executive summary of a new priority. Um, the first master plan, which included the improvements to Flax Pond, was decided to be done in all four phases, one park at a time, and then move on to a second park. After the demand and the interest from local uh, groups, we stopped our work at Flax Pond and the last phase, and we began and redirected our work to Sandy Pond, which um, is a part of this master plan. And uh, we're looking at new funding approaches to make that happen. So that's my introduction, and I will leave it up to the very competent uh, representatives from CDM Smith. These gentlemen have been very impactful in your community. They've designed bathhouses at your beaches. They've designed the Homer Park from start to finish and capping of the landfill. Process works. Happy to take questions, comments. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I guess I'm trying to make sure before we open it up, we understand what direction we're trying to get to here tonight. Is this informational? Are we looking for a priority? The um, master plan as presented to you has been paid for through the uh, Community Preservation Grant. <laughs> And so we're not looking for additional funding at this point. Um, the Recreation Commission's um, concept was to have it approved and have your blessing that these um, designs are with what you feel meet your goals. And then they'll do their work to find the appropriate funding to try to implement them. Um, as you know, uh, capital improvements come again with a 20-year uh, plan and the Sandy Pond improvement interface plan has been on the capital improvement project list for a number of years and we haven't done a lot of infrastructure work there except for maintaining the uh, softball fields to be one of the premier softball fields on the Cape as, as the men's uh, old timers league will tell you and also to uh, address the needs of the local high schools and our middle school who doesn't have tennis courts so we've done our best to keep them active but a lot of the other work that has been deferred knowing that we have this master plan coming and hoping that we could find funding so tonight what we're looking for you to do is look at the plan as it's presented see if you feel it meets the needs of the community and then give us your blessing to work on forward to see if we can fund the pickleball or the splash pad or some of the other parts and get the engineering and design funded so that we know if we cherry pick the splash pad by the par pond that um, we know where to put it so that when we go back to put the other playgrounds in and we have plenty to do that 
that um, it's in the right place and it won't impact infrastructure. So tonight we're just looking for your blessing to accept it. Is that correct, commissioners? Yes. And so the commission has already approved this? That's correct. They voted and approved it um, a month ago. Have you, one of my questions when we talk about the turf field, I know that the school district as well is talking about a turf field, and I guess with the investment return, you wonder how much need there is for it. Have you had conversations with the school district? We looked at a synthetic turf field in the first iteration of this master plan, yeah. and it was decided that that was not feasible for a municipal setting. It would be more appropriate for the school, so we, we, we removed ourselves from the uh, wanting a, a turf, uh, synthetic turf field, and what we did is we added Natural. this okay. additional strip of 75 feet so that we could help shift some of the pressure off of the goal mounts. It's not enough to be able to turn the fields like we'd like to, and that's how you really protect the goal mounts, but unfortunately with this buffer, and the, the respect of the neighbors, we decided to leave it as is and so we could shift it a little and maybe use it as a smaller field in three small fields one year and then a full field another year. We're trying hard because that's what happens. We have to replace the, the trip every year. Mm -hmm. So we're working, so we're increasing it to give us some op options for the field. And that's at Sandy Pond, but artificial turf we're recommending at the Peter Homer Park. Uh, that's right, because it has lights, and the only place that would make sense to put artificial turf would be where we could expand the field and we would look at that for use <coughs> and support of the high school programs, and no football wouldn't fit there. Soccer and field hockey and some of our other programs, including the band, would fit on that field, and it would be a secondary use under lights that would be able to accommodate activities and games. But is that too much saturation for the community to have multiple fields of that nature? No, neither has six. Well, I guess that's what I'm saying. And, and we have to look at that as a need. And again, with, by the time we get to do this, um, the new sports facility that's been introduced in Hyannis, who's got um, fields, mm -hmm. might be taking a part of that slack and they wouldn't need such a thing. But we would wait until we get to that point to, to do that. And then Sandy Pond is next, although it will be a while. I think that the overflow parking at the um, the park is really important, but I'm very concerned about the safety. When people do do the overflow parking, people are often parked alongside the road, and kids are crossing with their family. And so, I can't see any expansion of overflow parking without some type of safety um, uh, consideration on Old Town House Park. Absolutely, and, 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 absolutely. And, and there are a couple of um, crossings, lights, and that we've seen utilized in other communities that once you approach the crosswalk, it sets the light off for you, and it stops that flow of traffic. Now, maybe we don't want to stop the flow of traffic going to the landfill or the, the, the drop-off area, but there are amenities available for low cost that would stop traffic flow and make it safe in the crosswalk. I think that's very important. And and I guess one of the things I know, and I know Eric's probably going to talk about it because we had a discussion about it when we did the Route 6A park um, with the half courts, the basketball. Is that something that's really utilized, the two half courts instead of making one large? Is there a need no. for that? No. I, the half court at Homer, I mean at um, There's two Thatcher Park. Down here. Yes, the half park at Thrasher is, is used, the half basketball court, but it's not utilized for games. And the two here are because there's younger kids and older people who are playing, and because of the drawing to the park, we thought there would be enough people that we could split and have three play spaces instead of just one, you know. So we do two halves. Two halves, three full. And what's nice about, you know, placement of the two halves is that if, the, if it's a town need, that they need four full courts. Two halves equals one court anyway. So we realize that the space is provided. I saw that. And I guess my, my other question is, what's the, um, you know, when you talk about adding concessions at, say, at Sandy, and you see the facilities that we've already pr produced at Flax, I mean, I guess we're, and now we're proposing to split pickleball courts to two places. Um, what's the rationale for not keeping them all in one place. We were trying to spread usage for impact out um, and give amenities in the, in the community to the locals that would travel there by bike or foot. 
so we didn't have all one, though it could be. Um, a concession is a general term. I think a park of this nature probably wouldn't support a paid concession like a beach would. So what we would see would be concession would be um, vending machines or an option like that that um, would provide drinks and some healthy snacks. But I can't imagine that anyone could make a living at a concession stand at uh, Sandy Pond. So we would be more creative in how we provided it. But we need a space to secure those vending machines or do some work like that or bring in a food truck at different use times. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Okay, um, Eric? Really sharp. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of things that can be said, and if tonight you're just looking for um, us to say, yeah, they're beautiful plans, and I'm not sure that now is the time to say them, because they are. They're, they're, they're great plans. They're, they're ambitious. Um, you could argue that a lot of it is needed. Uh, perhaps some of it isn't needed. Um, and, and at this point, I mean, I, I'm willing to say, you know, continue the investigation. I think that um, the conversation will expand when it comes time to figure out how to fund these things. Um, Norm will get into operations and maintenance and that sort of thing. And <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it, like I said, if, if tonight you're just looking for us to say that you know we agree with them in concept and, and looking for our approval to proceed with developing these plans, then I think you know I can give you that. But there, there are much larger discussions to be had. Good point. Good and second that I I think um, uh, you know obviously the, you know the, the beautiful park renderings and. There's a number of things I'd want in, uh, uh, as part of this, and one is the build-up. What's the anticipated build-up? Uh, what period of time? I'm not asking you to answer it off the cuff, uh, because not only is that important from a planning perspective, but it influences the cost. Today's cost, identified here, uh, escalates pretty substantially as we've seen in the school system proposals. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think we need to have a, a very uh, careful analysis of, of uh, what the anticipated build-out is and uh, kind of over what period of time. Um, at the same time, I think we need to get a picture of what are the maintenance costs and what are the repetitive costs that we can anticipate? We already are seeing some indication in the reports that you've prepared that a number of the courts, uh, basketball courts, tennis courts, whatever, are in need of replacement slash repair. So what is the normal uh, replacement uh, scenario for those kinds of expenditures? And what are the upkeep costs? And, and I think it's important that we, we have a projection of, you know, if we've got a projection of, of what the capital costs are going to be based on our plan to build out, what's the end point? And what are the maintenance costs at that end point? Uh, when everything is done, what, what is the uh, cost to the community in terms of annual, annual cost, including a portion of the capital funding? Because I've been anticipating that we would plan to set up a capital fund to deal with the major expenditures for the future. So, you know, I, I look for that kind of thing as, as an important before we make any commitments of construction funds uh, for the project. Um, I still question, Sandy, I think we had some discussion about Sandy Pond and the beach area and the utilization, utility of that pond uh, for swimming. Um, I've very been there, um, I wouldn't swim there. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other nicer places along Long Pond, for example, um, that are available that uh, I would go to and, and have. 
uh, for fresh water access or over to tennis ponds. So, you know, I, I'm concerned about <coughs> investing funds there, um, uh, duplication of facilities if we want. Um, I'm also, uh, I'm also question demographics. Um, and what I mean by that is, I would hate to see our community developed into a situation where everybody has to drive to something. I think we need a, a, a walk-friendly community. Uh, and I haven't heard any discussion of what the, you know, we've got 2,000 kids in town. Mm -hmm. Where do they live? A lot in and West Europe. Excuse me? Many in West Yard. Okay. That the new rail trail that will have a spar off of it into this park will service. Okay, and I, and I guess I would, I would uh, say that I would hope that we would develop those facilities that are closer to where our demographic focus is and concentrations are so that mm -hmm. we do the most service to the town and uh, at the same time concentrate our investment where it gets the biggest bang. Well, I think the discussions with the committee members and some of the public meetings was to focus on Sandy Pond mm -hmm. because in that regard. old townhouse road, you know, you've already been built there, it's built back in 2000, somewhere around right. there, and you've been able to <coughs> implement phases of the master plan from 2007 at the Fox Pond site. Mm -hmm. And all three are connected by the rail trail, so you mm -hmm. can get there without driving a car. Okay, good point. Um, the, the last point uh, to all of you pickleball people out in the room uh, is, um, you know, I think there's been you know, over the last number of years some proposals for CPA funds uh, to be utilized for golf. And the typical process here that I've seen in the past is that CPA funds are being asked for for these kinds of uh, recreational projects. I think we have to be very careful about the equity uh, between the uh, uh, community members who enjoy the golf facilities and who are not, <coughs> are being refused CPA funding, and people uh, who uh, would enjoy tennis and pickleball free of charge. I think there's a, I have a concern that we're going to put potentially half a million dollars in each one of these locations of, of tennis and pickleball. And what is our economic return on that? Do we have memberships? How really? do we manage that? Would you like that answer now or would you want me to come back to you? Whatever. Well, you can try now. <laughs> but, yeah. um, I think pickleball is evolving to a point where um, they're kind of, they're not kind of, where there's a decision that needs to occur. In other communities, pickleball price charge, $35 for a session. It's coordinated through the town recreation department. Monies are put into a reserve account. It's used for improvements. Yarmouth doesn't have that yet because they're so new. It's only a year plus that they've gone from 40 players to over 200. Mm -hmm. So I think there's um, an openness, and though I haven't spoken to all of the players, but by some to let us look at letting the town manage it, and in that way be able to run some tournaments, some um, workshops and some other ways to, re to generate revenue, just like we were talking about beach fees, that would be reserved. We have a recreation reserve for appropriation fund. That fund is set up, so we take a part of a, of a fee that we charge, we put it into the reserve, and it's used for capital projects approved at town meeting. I think that this um, is a perfect example of growth in recreational programs. I mean, we're not going to make six million, and we're not going to become the New England U.S. Open of pickleball <laughs> like um, Naples is at this point because they have, and I sent you that link if you want to look at it or have a chance to. But I also think that we, we are on the cutting edge and we have some opportunity and we have some very highly motivated and intelligent um, citizens who um, are giving up their time and knowledge freely to help us build it in that direction. I think there's a willingness to pay to play, but it's not going to be like joining the tennis club. You can't charge those type of fees, but I think we can do activities and tournaments to raise those fees. Uh, what are you, I mean, we're, I know we have at least one tennis club in town. Two. Two? Yeah, there's South Yarmouth, which is a, a clay courts, and then there's the Mid Cape Club. Okay. 
Do we know what the utilization of those private facilities are? Tennis is a different game than pickleball. Those are tennis. That's correct. There's some tennis courts. So, so we have no pickleball facilities except those that we have created for this group in the last six months. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, I, I'm interested in seeing what your projections are of revenue versus the operating maintenance costs, capital costs of those facilities. Me too. We're going to keep you busy. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by <clears throat> offering a little bit of historical um, perspective on the old townhouse park and versus golf and so forth um, that Norm brought up. <clears throat> that old townhouse park land originally was earmarked for another golf course. It was going to be a full golf course rather than an additional nine holes. And I was on the rec commission at the time, I was the chairman, um, and I was on the commission for over 20 years, and uh, with my good friend Debbie Clark here, who's still on the recreation commission. I don't know what she's going through, but she's starting to go small for a world record, I guess. But in any event, um, there was a survey taken, and the people in the community said, we have enough golf courses, we want that land, all of that land, devoted to recreation. So all kinds of different ideas were floated, including a um, uh, one of those water slide parks, which of course people didn't like. And, uh, so there was a compromise, and and Rec owned some land that they transferred to the golf course, almost equal in size to the land they ended up with for the old townhouse park. And the park was built, and because we didn't have the land we wanted. Uh, and and could, it, it wouldn't be as expansive as we wanted, we put in lights, figuring that we could have more intensity of use if we couldn't have the breadth of use. And they put that in Georgia Lair, and I had quite a, uh, a skirmish on that. They tried to put it in as an alternative, an alternative bid item, and I said, no way, because we had already gotten a grant from the state. It was, it was a million plus, and... Um, I said that, that grant was given based on the fact that we had this particular design. And uh, I hope there's nobody in George's family here, but I kind of threatened George that if we didn't get the lights, I was going to go rat them out to the state. In any event, that's really how Old Townhouse came about. And because we, you know, we didn't have, um, you know, the generating capability that golf had, they agreed that they would perform the maintenance on the park. At that time, <laughs> golf was very profitable, and it isn't now, but it was then. And um, so that's how Old Town House came to be. That's how these nine holes we uh, relinquished and gave that land to the golf course. Now, people like me that were around then paid for that golf course. There's many, many land takings um, to put that golf course together. And the town, as it turned out, from the court's points of view, didn't offer the people the fair value of, of that land. So there were many, many suits against the town that went to the land court, and most of them resulted in judgments against the town. And so an astronomical amount of money was paid for by the citizens of this community for those golf courses. So people that don't golf, it's not fair to say they don't contribute to the golf course. It's you can put it another way and say those who golf are golfing on the people's golf course. Um, I don't golf. I'm probably the only lawyer in the Cape that does it. But I support golf. It's a recreational activity. It, it's a good way to preserve open space. People like to do it. I'm fully supportive of it. But there's other forms of recreation too, like pickleball. And if people want to play pickleball, I think they should play. Um, when I first came to the Rec Commission, the programs were all geared toward, toward younger people, and through time we expanded our scope uh, of, of services and our definition of what recreation was, and we tried to um, have something for everybody, implement swimming programs for seniors. When we designed the park at Old Townhouse, we tried to put in some miniature walking facilities for, for elderly and, uh, people and for uh, middle-aged people. 
So our concept has always been from from the early days going forward to reach out to you know all segments of society. And I think it's a great opportunity with the demand for pickleball to do that. I will say, however, that there is some redundancy, I think, in terms of locating a, 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 a good number of pickleball courts in both facilities, at least initially. And um, I think, you know, the artificial turf I'm very suspect of, too, because of the cost and the fact that Mike Sherman, the former coach of the Green Bay Packers, they're building a mega sports complex in Barnstable, inside and outside. And I think it's going to be very difficult to compete with that. Um, so, you know, if, if the people want the pickleball, that's where I'd start. I, I would try to break out and phase in these various aspects. I do like the designs. I must, I must mention that. I think you guys did a, did a fine job on that. Um, but going forward, from a, a cost standpoint, I think you look at where the demand is, and you start there, and um, you build up. So um, I, I do support what you folks would like to see happen. Um, but I don't think we can afford to do all of this work at the same time. I think you get a point of clarification, because I, I'm not sure uh, the, my impression has been, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong, that the golf course has been carrying debt, and that, that and they've been paying off that debt that was then incurred in order to acquire the land and to build the fortress. And I thought that that was one of the reasons that our courses have uh, had a, a really tough time meeting a, the cash flow requirements is because the debt was so substantial as a result of the acquisitions that took place. Now, if I'm wrong about that, that's that's fine. <coughs> it was just my I, I can check that out, Norm. My understanding was that that was not the case, but I, I could be wrong about that. I'll find there out. A, a huge amount of I had the discussion with Jim Quirk about it, and, and he yeah. remembers it the way I do, but, but again, if if I, because I'm wrong on that, I'd be Because um, I think that is a, 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 a crucial point. <coughs> think, uh, the, but there's also the fact that I do know the courses have been carrying a substantial amount of debt. If, if it's not the original acquisition cost, it's right. certainly the development cost of the courses, and that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. We're not talking about the original cost of acquiring the land on which the course would be built. We're talking about the capital costs of building those courts and the ongoing maintenance costs. So the point is, though, that golf um, was really the, the favored leisure time activity in town for many, many years. Um, and when Sandy Pond, excuse me, when the old Townhouse Park came online, we only got that portion by way of compromise. The public sentiment was they wanted to give the whole 18 holes that area to recreation. Uh, I know because I was involved in the day-to-day -day, um, negotiation of that and the design of it and the development of that park. Um, the other thing is with kids, I mean, we have to look at this from a human point of view, too. Kids can't pay the user fees that adults can pay. That's just a fact of life. There's a lot of poor families. There's a lot of young families that are really struggling down here. Um, you know, I'm not a... Um, a pay-for-play kind of guy. I think there's certain things kids should be entitled to do in the community, and one is to have adequate recreational facilities. And regardless of how much money their parents make or don't make, that's where I'm coming from. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, thank everybody that showed up here tonight. It's been a, it's been a long night. It's been for some of you three plus hours. And I think to show up here and spend time to, to demonstrate your support for the, this master plan, this vision for Yarmouth Recreation, uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, I, I want to thank the Recreation Commission, Pat, and everybody else that's worked on this. This has taken a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort. Uh, I've enjoyed at least participating in some of the discussions at the Recreation Commission. And uh, you work very hard and we appreciate uh, all your service to the town. Um, I've seen a lot of master plans. I've seen a lot of uh, 
these these kinds of plans, and I'd have to say that this is a, this is a very very good job. Um, and I have to give kudos to CDM for the work that they've done for the town. Um, our recreational facilities are, are terrific. Yes, there's some work that we could probably be doing more of in some areas, but the reality is, is they get utilized, they're draws, uh, they bring other people to the town. Um, I mean, as a kid, if I wasn't shagging golf balls out at Sports World, I was hanging out at one of the town's rec facilities with my friends. We didn't belong to any sailing clubs or any yacht clubs. Uh, our rec our time was spent playing basketball, playing football, uh, out on the town's athletic fields. And you can see over the years those the use of the fields growing. So the work that's been done in this town has, I think, gone to help help kids mature and do the right things to stay out of trouble. Uh, I know with my friends, if they weren't out playing, if we weren't out playing basketball. Uh, whether it was Indian or at some of the other courts in town, I think uh, who knows what some of these kids would be doing. So, it almost making these kinds of investments almost to help define community. I mean, that's that's really what this is all about. Uh, and the question we have today is: Is this the vision that we accept and helps supports what we think we should be doing long term in terms of our rec facilities? Now, one of the reasons why it's helpful to have a master plan is because you need a vision. You need to know what you're going to do. You're not going to do this all at once, but you need to know how the pieces fit. All right. If you want to attract, as someone who likes to bring grant money into town or into other towns in Massachusetts, you need to have a plan. That's the, that's the bottom line. You need to have a plan, you need to have the cost estimates, and you need to have a vote of support from the Board of Selectmen. Simple as that. If this plan is supported, if this plan is well done and put together and has the support of the community and this board, you now have the ability to start knocking on doors. I mean, we've had foundation money come into the rec programs before. We've had private monies come in. You now have a starting point, and you can begin building this program. Uh, I will admit I know nothing about pickleball. I'm very ignorant about it, but I do know this, that... Uh, I have a couple of friends of mine that are on the board of selectmen in Mashpee, and they swear they swear about the importance of this. And I know Splash <coughs> Parks. I knew nothing about that, but I'll never forget uh, one of the selectmen in Mashpee saying the worst vote he ever took was being against the Splash Park. <laughs> um, and so he he swore that he would never do repeat that mistake. So I think you folks have really looked hard at the kinds of things that people need that they want to participate in. You know that in some of these areas, I think, quite frankly, from an economic development point of view, one of the things that we don't really appreciate is outdoor recreation. It's a multi-billion dollar industry in this country. It's a huge part of the Cape economy. <coughs> so to the extent that we may be a bit ambitious, I don't have a problem with that because I know these facilities will get used. I do share the concern of some of the members here about maintenance and taking care of it, but that's why we look at beach fees and that's why we look at other things to help us stay on top of these facilities. So I just, I, I fully endorse this. I think this is a wonderful plan. It's a great vision. And I think if we can endorse this soon and quickly, it would be a great first step in terms of building support and, and give us a chance to start going after funding at the state level, federal level, and from other sources of funding that we're particularly interested in. It wouldn't surprise me if you attract money on the pickle uh, ball, or that level, aspect of this. I wouldn't surprise me if you're able to attract some money for that. So, uh, I should... Well, funny you brought up the splashback, because if we had younger families come out like um, these pickleball people, we'd probably have a splash pad by now, but they didn't, and we don't. So, <laughs> but I'll say, you know, one of the things that I enjoyed... Know, but I'm just saying, it's, yeah. it's so nice to see, yeah. to, to Mark's point, it's nice to see you. But people, it's a pickleball court. Yeah, but we're not taking public comment. I'm sorry. Yeah. May, may I just add one thing? As we look to our families and our children, we also need to look at our, our seniors. And if Kathy Bailey were here, you know that I wouldn't have to speak because she already would be. But she'll tell you that as we live longer and we uh, medical uh, medical advances keep us here, it's, we, we uh, often need support. No, 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 no. We have a walking family, right? You're in the middle and the parents are on top and the little ones are underneath and 
I did my sacrifice. To a new age where their loved ones are sick, they're starting to get sick, and they need that kind of support of, of a community. And pickleball creates that community, and walking trails create that community, and the adult swim programs and the other things that recreation is doing so that we can keep them active as long and within a community. We talk community and people get hidden in their houses because of illnesses or financial constraints, so we need to make things affordable so people can get out, socialize, keep cognitively and physically healthy and support one another. I remember when my mom came here by herself and she was a church goer and she would go every morning to mass and about two weeks into it, she looked at the woman next to her and said, do you drink coffee? Let's go to Donkey's. And by the time three weeks was done, she had eight girlfriends and they called each other if they didn't show up for, for coffee out and they didn't go to church and they were checking on each other and that's how it works. That's what a community is all about. And for this group here, I, I, I think I'm speaking for you to say that that's what pickleball is for you, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's a social and it makes you feel a part of the community and you're now using probably parts of that community, i.e. our parks that you wouldn't have used before. So thank you for understanding well, that I, and supporting that. I now. think that a community is what Mike said too. And it's, it's all ages and I think that this plan has pieces for all ages and, and, and it's a great overall plan. I, I, I think to Nora's point about maintenance, that's always an issue. But also an analysis, like with Sandy Pond, is it is it worth the, the value of investing there? So I'd, I'd love to endorse it, but I'd also love to see the Recreation Commission really prioritize, because it always comes down to funds, and I agree with Mark that there's a lot of funds available out there once we have the concept. But, you know, it comes down to prioritizing, and, and hopefully CPC funds will be available for some things, and... I know you'll twist everybody's arm possible because that's what Pat Armstrong does. And um, someone called me Pat Strong Arm the other day. This woman, people don't realize the amount of funding she got for the Flax Pond facility. If you haven't been down to our Flax Pond facility and saw um, the beautiful uh, Russo Lodge and, and the amenities there, I mean, that happened because of Pat. And, in the recognition and, they're still well active. yes but we know what you're doing every day and we know what they're doing every day and, and you know so we see a, a vision we see dollar signs and, and we can make it happen Thank you. so, so would, would it be appropriate to offer a motion to endorse the um, this master this recreation master plan is there a second second Since I've been here, Tomorrow. some things that have been thrown out and put up and uh, all very well thought out, but this is an opportunity to get some clear direction from the board as to where the next steps and energy ought to go. All points are all taken. Clearly, I've had a lot of dialogue with members on a couple of concerns about cost going forward and whatnot, but I think they're at the point now where they would like to be able to have some clear sense that this is where we can put our energies on as it was depicted here. But as time goes on, things do change, and they did recognize that. But the master plan begins that process. When we were looking at the schools, um, you, you might be aware of the fact that the Armington was looking at a new school building in town. We're talking to the architects and the engineers. They said the inflation factor for building out in the future, well, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, somewhere around 5% per year, right? Now, it, I assume that if, if you did this piecemeal, you're talking about different inflation factors for, for different aspects of this, but if you were to put in one of those parts, the pickleball courts, for example, what would the build-out inflation factor be? Not the parks. We've been using about 3% a year. About but 3 you don't have, like, in a building, you know, yeah, the materials right. that can change. Like, That's why I qualify the question. Yeah, exactly. This About is more moving dirt around and paving and those things. Right. 
At three percent, three percent, every ten years adds fifty percent. Of course, you know, we're rich and be beautiful to say mm -hmm. yes. Unfortunately, you know, um, without knowing the prioritization of it, it is difficult to say that we're giving them direction because we're really not. You know, at this point, we're just saying this is great. Well, why don't we include <coughs> the prioritization in the direction that we should give them at, at the same time as you know, agreeing to the planning concept? You mean to ask them to come back with a prioritization that we can approve? They need the next step. That's how I see it. I mean, I think it's difficult to just say, hand this back to you and mm -hmm. say we approve it. What does that mean to you? In, in two well, or three weeks, you'll see that the um, CPA has been evaluating two requests that are part of this master plan. One is to do the phase three pickleball courts and flats, and the other is to um, fund the engineering and design at Sandy so that we have an ability to then go forward and choose the priorities of the community, again asking for public input in the selecting blessing. Your approval of this plan tonight does not guarantee any money. It doesn't guarantee a future vote of acceptance. It doesn't give us any commitment that we can move forward. It just tells us that within these parameters we can continue now to do our work and we're, cl we're on the track that you want to see us. Without this, I can't go to the state and ask for a grant because I don't have a vote of the selectmen and I don't have any way to collect any kind of matching funds from private foundations or any mm -hmm. other funding sources outside of CPA which might disappear in two years and that's an okay. awful short amount of time. So all I'm asking is for your blessing to trust the commission and the mm -hmm. staff to do their work to find the right way and the funding that you're comfortable enough with that will allow us to move forward with parts of the plan. Mm -hmm. I guess if, if uh, the guarantee is that the zero maintenance costs built into the future. Well, well, no, you mean then, then that you will have to incur. proceed forward without an estimate. Our population has shrunk. Yes, sir. Our population has shrunk in this town and uh, we're expanding <laughs> facilities. I can't and make I, that. And I think that it's important that we understand what our financial commitments are. And uh, proceeding forward with a concept and saying, okay, go full speed on uh, developing further details, spending more money on, on, on consulting without at least having the, the uh, conceptual framework for what is going to be our financial commitment over a period of time. I know what you, you've got right now, right? Can I please have the attention? That's very rude. Um, having uh, uh, not having the projections over a period of time, not knowing what the maintenance costs are, I think is is just an incomplete picture. And we've got a lot of commitments uh, in our town. Uh, and, and very substantial capital commitments, and we've got unfunded uh, uh, capital needs and maintenance needs for existing facilities. So I'm very concerned about our capacity with our population base of uh, asking people to spend more uh, when we haven't met our existing commitments. And I think that that's, that's uh, you know, I think it's only reasonable to ask what kind of uh, uh, maintenance expenditures we can expect with this, if not a uh, uh, projected build out period. I would just, and I, I totally understand where you're coming from, but I think as long as it's in concept with what Pat was just saying, that we haven't approved any particular parcel piece. Uh, funding of that when when those plans specifically come before us we'll have the opportunity I believe at that yeah. time yeah. to make sure yeah. that those pieces are in place before we approve it. I don't think it's unreasonable to ask for maintenance costs okay. now. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's a, uh, uh, a, a <laughs> Something we incur day to day mm. that we spend on our existing facilities, and I think it's entirely reasonable mm. to expect mm. a conceptual plan to come with that kind of detail. 
Norm, are you talking about maintenance costs, assuming you know the entire plan were developed, or are you talking about the initial phase, for example, let's say they, they decided to go forward with well, well, pickleball courts and flax. Is that the maintenance cost you'd want to see now? Yeah, but, but part of the issue with this is that we don't have the uh, enough into the concept to show what the build-out would be, what the anticipated priorities are. And so we don't know what those additional costs would be in any, in any uh, uh, year. So you want to see a, prior, a prioritization? Yeah, I, and you know, then, and I and, and I the think corresponding maintenance cost of each phase. That's right. I mean, and certainly I would expect the recreation uh, commission to come back with, okay, let's do these things first, and uh, and and with that, we would then have an idea of what the uh, anticipated maintenance costs associated with those facilities are. Right now, we have we, we don't have any of that. Can I ask a question? Uh, Pat, is it your sense that the prioritization, the first priority would be uh, some, either a build out of um, pickleball courts, either at one or both facilities? Yes, sir. Okay. And my second question is can you develop that prior prioritization more specifically as to, you know, what you would want to do initially with the pickleball courts and get a maintenance cost? figure that corresponds to that. If they follow the proposed plan as it sits before you and we've already put before the CPA for funding to go to this town's meeting that's being considered and you'll be seeing that by the time it comes back before the board uh, for your consideration as a CPA application, mm -hmm. we'll be able to put together for you a maintenance cost um, based on the plan as it sits now. Is that, that means yes. <laughs> That means just mm -hmm. as to the build out of the of the uh, courts at Flax Pond and Sandy Pond, along with the uh, driveway and the parking at Sandy Pond, because the existing <coughs> courts are now where the new driveway is going, the new parking area. So we would we would at Sandy do the courts and the parking lot, and at Flax we would just do the courts. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Four to one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And I appreciate your uh, patience. As you know, our regular hearing room that does hold more people um, was flooded. And I really appreciate you standing. It's unfortunate, but I do appreciate it. Thank you. Well, come to the meeting. Um, we had our public comment section during that section of the meeting. We're going to let the petitioner um, speak first, but uh, chances are we probably will not be having public comment on this particular item as the um, as the uh, petitioner has asked for a continuance. So with that, I will uh, allow um, the folks from Vineyard Wind to uh, make a statement. Thank you. Um, I will be super quick so we've had a very long night already. Um, but yes, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, we were on the gym today. Um, just to be mindful, we were on the gym today because of a continuation of a hearing uh, that started November 28th about the proposed host community agreement uh, with <coughs> Yarmouth. And as we said earlier in the meeting tonight, um, we, we were here um, while we uh, uh, we want to uh, you know, be in touch, uh, we move around the agenda, um, be available for updates if you'd like, but I, I know you probably don't want to take the time for that at this point. Well, it's not that we want to take the time, just for a matter of background, yeah. we had a discussion previously at a, at a previous meeting, since the meeting um, that you were at last when we continued, okay. and um, we need to be more informed about the MEGA process, so yeah. I well, what our board had asked was that town council come and give us kind of a step-by-step -step process of, of what that is. There's some, you know, the chicken or the egg thing, you know, what comes first? And what we need to know in terms of um, the process. So that was the request of this board okay. um, since you were last here. So um, I'm glad you're asking for a continuance because it's, I think it's an important thing that before we go any further that we have that type of information. Right, exactly. And in fact, we've already met with um, uh, two or three of the town staff who explained to us actually that they did have a request from, from the select board. And we did provide them a schedule of, of upcoming um, 
of, of the permitting process ahead of us. And it is, you know, we are some weeks into it at this point. We did file um, the, uh, what's called the environmental notification form, the ENF, uh, last month, as well as the um, EFSB petition and um, the uh, federal permitting document, which is called a uh, construction and operation plan to use ocean energy management. So those were just filed. Um, they said uh, some weeks ago, um, and uh, so we are really just a um, fairly month into uh, what would be a 18-month, uh, if not longer, process um, with multiple opportunities for public comment, and also a process that, by law, has um, has local um, points of input with the conservation commission and the um, zoning boards. So, um, so we are at the start of the process and provided that schedule um, to, to your staff. Um, and we, and um, we stand ready to uh, provide any other information on that. Um, and even aside from the formal um, uh, permitting process, we do sincerely you know, want to hear input um, into the project. Um, we've been, um, we have been reaching out. We've um, uh, hired uh, someone else to help us um, we double that effort, um, Nate Mayo here tonight, um, and so, you know, we just would ask to, uh, you know, our door is open, uh, we, we, you know, we'll be around here um, after this meeting if, if folks in the audience want to meet with us, we've already reached out to a number of you, and, and uh, we really do want to take the next months, um, you know, tell what, in the letter um, that I sent earlier this week, we proposed uh, March 20th for, for another date, so, to take that time um, to uh, to continue hearing from from residents, um, you know, we you know, I, I think we would all agree that we, we need to keep doing our homework, um, and we, we, you know, we're sincere about that, and um, and we want to have an opportunity to uh, to continue get input and um, have have conversations. Continue. There's been a number of good conversations already. And just. Uh, see if we can uh, better understand the issues and, and how we might be able to, uh, to address them to the satisfaction of, of more folks in the town. Um, and, and that's, again, that's all aside from the, uh, the formal permitting process that will be underway um, simultaneously as it's as <coughs> um, So that's, that's why we, uh, you know, we want to be available here tonight. Um, but yes, we, we did um, as indicate in the letter on the 9th of this month, um, proposed to, uh, to whether it's a formal continuation or um, to uh, just defer, you know, um, a decision and, and formally end the hearing that started on the 28th and just take it up again on the 20th, um, you know, in March, um, you know, that's, that's sort of a, a, a nuance that, that we don't feel strongly about, but um, there is an important distinction in that part of the reason you haven't heard from us directly is because once that hearing is open, um, you know, it, it kind of limits our ability to communicate because we're, you know, under public meetings rules and so on. So, uh, you know, it's, I defer to you on that, but, you know, our, our preference would be to formally end that hearing and just put it on the agenda again for the 20th um, and sort of start a new then. But if you prefer to continue, of course, that, that's totally fine. I'll make the motion to allow the applicants to withdraw their requests. I don't see any point in putting a date certain on it in case you can't make that deadline. We'll just leave it up to you to decide when you want to come back. If we're not continuing a date, it doesn't matter. Right. We have to be re emphasized. Right. That's why I don't want to attach a date to it. I'm just I'm allowing them to withdraw without prejudice. Is there a second to that? Mm -hmm. Is there any discussion? And you're okay with that? Yes, thank you. Is okay. there any discussion on that? All those in favor? All right. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much, and again, we're available to uh, meet with anyone here afterwards or on our website. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, just one more thing. Um, the, the NEPA process, NEPA process that I mentioned, um, if I could just explain, it's a, it's actually a scoping process. It's not a permitting process per se. Uh, so it's actually defining the project and, um, and taking input from the public, but also from other regulators to make sure that um, all the appropriate appro uh, permits are that we're subject to all the appropriate uh, permits. Um, so that uh, the first public comment period for that process um, is ends January 30th, 
Um, so all the details about about submitting public comment to that is on our website. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, we will move to uh, the next item of is to review the questions I submitted. Yeah. Hey, have a good day, guys. Thanks. See you later now. Bye-bye. Sounds like a wind turbine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Down in a second. So this is a, a series of questions that were developed. Carl von Holm was kind enough to Sorry. aggregate the information. Um, I don't have the particular authorship of each question, but Conservation Commission had a meeting. From that meeting, there was a variety of different requests for uh, submission were put forward. Carl, no? Uh, yeah. No. Uh, here. Some of the input was from individuals. They did not uh, present group. this at a, okay. at a hearing. All right. It was just in Yeah, actually, if you want to talk, to the, I didn't see it back there. There were so many people, I you kind of wondered. in there. Mike Glenn. I can't to Glenn. That's a good thing. Uh, uh, okay. the, the input that I provided um, the town administrator's office was uh, comments that uh, I heard at a number of the public uh, sessions that I attended on uh, Vineyard Wind, uh, as well as comments that were presented to us, uh, and comment from uh, individuals uh, on some of the town boards, as well as a number of my uh, comments uh, are within those those questions or those asks that we might want uh, answers to as we move forward. So, you know, many of the questions are revolved around what are the impacts of the cable to sediment drift. To the, the type of uh, method they propose to install the cable is, there's not a lot of history on that. There's not a lot of understanding of what that would look like to the uh, uh, habitat that's inside the bay. Um, what I would say is that we met with Barnstable today to discuss uh, what the question submissions that they have. They're handling a number of questions related to uh, the impacts of a potential substation of gradient uh, and also uh, issues specific to uh, Barnstable and also the concert, uh, Cape Cod Commission's questions were rolled out today as well. And, and I think between the three entities, Barnstable, the Cape Cod Commission, and the series of questions asked here, we've done a pretty good job uh, as a submission would go to try to understand better if this project were to come. Uh, what would be those impacts on a lot of different fronts and how best to uh, go about understanding and analyzing those impacts. What's the Cape Cod Commission standing on this? As, as I recall from the last process, that they chimed in but had no relevance in the process whatsoever. Well, I mean, everybody to some degree that's, uh, you know, you have a public comment period, so they're, they're to, the, the process that we're in now is to try to define what should be looked at by the different agencies until to how thorough that should be done. So they, they commented that as a regional planning entity for the Cape, they came at it from that angle. So are there things that should be, um, I guess I just want to make sure without, without doing, I wish we had town council's process 
and so, understand yeah. prior to having this? No, I understood. So this is just a submission of questions to the state uh, that they can carry forward. The, the process between federal, state, and local level, that staff is working on putting that together for the February 13th meeting. I mean, I, I trust me, you know, there was, I, I'd like to be able to wave a wand and have everything done too, but uh, along the way from the last time we met, there was a lot of other hurdles that we encountered, but we've, we've, one of the things that we were clear on is we'd get that information to the yeah. board before there'd be another uh, opportunity for Vineyard Wind to come in front of you. So no, at this point, this is just simply questions to submit to the uh, MEPA program. If I can just add a comment. The, um, the MEPA comment period ends at the end of this month. So from my point of view, I would prefer that we not let that comment period end without outlining some of the concerns that our town departments have and the board has. It's important that we be on record outlining some of the concerns that we have. I don't think they expect us to, to say everything, but we should get pretty much the bulk of the concerns that we have on the record with MEPA. Many of these concerns, I believe, will echo some of the concerns that the residents in the Lewis Bay area have raised. I think they'll echo some of the concerns that maybe even some of the state agencies have raised. But I think to allow the comment period to end without the town at least being on record expressing some concerns that I think would be a problem. Um, I think for, for my purposes, and I, I address this to Carl and some of our own people, <coughs> is that the thing that I think is sort of reflected in this draft that we have, the letter of concern, um, what, what I think and, and, uh, is a concern over the unknowns. Uh, we have a very unusual and dynamic ecosystem there. Uh, the sediment transport processes are complicated. Uh, there are things that have been done there without adequate study, and we've seen the failure. We heard earlier the, the aircraft carrier or the landing strip. I mean, there are things that have been done up there that have been just a huge mistake. And had the proper studies and investigations been done, we would have had a much better idea on how these other proposals should have either been regulated, maybe even prevented. All right? But until we get at getting answers to a lot of these questions, from my point of view, it's going to be difficult to make informed judgments as to the pros and cons, whether or not they should happen or not. I'm sure the residents, in the meetings that I've been at, residents are looking for answers. What will be the impacts? What, what are the sediment processes underway there? So I think this letter gets at a lot of, a lot of these questions. So that's why I think it's, again, it's, we've got a deadline coming up. I'd hate to think that the deadline came and went. I think it's a problem for the town if we don't have something uh, on record expressing concern. Thanks. 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 I, I, I agree with um, Mark's uh, position. I don't know if the people understand what's in this letter, however. Um, I don't know if anybody has seen it. It's dated January 23rd, 18, and it's to the MEPO office, attention of Purvi Patel, or Pato, however you pronounce that. Uh, and it's about this project that covers concerns. Well, it starts off saying that the town has been identified as a potential location, landing location, and um, says where, you know, it talks about New Hampshire Ave and residential neighborhood and how it would be, the cable would be buried and on and on. And then it says the town requests the applicant fund the study of the Lewis Bay area in order to develop a baseline of its current state of health and to assist in proper post-projection remediation plan and on and on. And all kinds of studies that, that the town thinks should be done and, and all kinds of concerns, environmental concerns, uh, concerns about um, yeah, trans, the transmission lines and, um, you know, it's, it's fairly comprehensive. It's, there's 11 separate paragraphs that, that are identified. Um, and it's really asking the uh, MEPA folks to take into consideration a lot of the concerns that have been, have been expressed here and by various um, 
town boards. I'm, I'm sure it's not exhaustive. I, I think there's probably overlapping comments that individuals will be either have or will be um, sending in to me. But, um, and it, there's probably going to be some additional comments from, from people. But at least this, as Mark says, this does address impact on um, navigation, shell fishing, um, change of the habitat, want studies on, on all these all these things. Commercial boating, fishing industry, um, effects on Lewis Bay, potential cable breaks, safety measures and options, um, life expectancy of the proposed cable, um, environmentally safe materials and liquids, look into that. So I, I don't see anything negative here that, that um, could impact people. And I, you know, I, my, my sense was that there were others that we have talked about in the past that, um, you know, and, and I know we're in the planning process with regard to the 6A and that will make its way out to the the, the list, I think. And at some point in the past, I thought we had talked about the two intersections. Great Island. Is that Great Island? Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. And, it, and that's not on the, the five-year projection at this point. So I, I don't know where we are internally in the planning process. Yeah, those those uh, projects I mentioned are programmed in the TIP. So they have dedicated years and committed funding sources. But we certainly have a long list of other projects. Doesn't the NPO prioritize that list, or that's already done? Uh, they do, and the uh, next year of that five-year rotation will be coming up here the spring. They look for input on it. Go Norm. It's not. Uh, <laughs> it's not necessarily um, cast in stone. I mean, there are projects that may drop off, and there could be substitutions okay. and so forth. But but you need to have that information into the KCAP commission so that they understand. Uh, into the committee so that there's uh, consideration of those and, and um, advocacy for them so that the community is up, up front on those projects. Um, there was something else I wanted to say about that. Um, oh, um, they did announce at the meeting that um, the transit side of, the, of, of MPO has two trolleys that have been funded. And uh, I'm going to talk with Dennis about one of them uh, because Dennis has expressed a, um, an interest in having trolleys service their uh, beaches with off-site parking so that they can expand their capacity for uh, reaching the, uh, the beaches or for parking at the beaches. And I think we need and be thinking about that also with regard to our needs for trolley kind of service, whether it might be um, beach-related activities um, or other suitable things in our community. And, you know, and, and uh, I'll leave it to the, <laughs> the staff really to uh, think about those possibilities. But two additional vehicles um, that uh, I think we need to get our, our name yeah. and, and a description of what we would like to do with regard to those. Um, a couple of communities already talked about this. Okay. Norm? Yes. The trolleys, would they be under the control of the RTA? Yes. That's so uh, Tom Kahir is probably somebody that you need to uh, speak with. Or Bob Lutton. Yeah. I think Bob Lutton is our representative on the RTA. Yeah, yeah Bob. Yeah, okay. well, he's been on our representative on the RTA for forever. <laughs> Yeah, when I was in Providence town, town manager's office, he was, right, he was the rep when I ages ago when I was in local government. And that's where the cost <laughs> Yeah. So if there's an inquiry trolley, Bob's Bob's your man. Um, the the other thing I wanted to say a little bit about, and I'm hesitant at this point. I, I talked last evening at the school committee meeting about uh, the progress on our negotiations. And I think it's only right, um, all our negotiations, negotiations with Dennis on the regional uh, school agreement have been done in public. So 
So uh, I'm not really going to say anything different from what has been said in public. Uh, however, I think uh, we've kind of hit a, a bump in the road. And, and as I said last evening, whether you see that as a, a stone wall or whether you see it as a speed bump, kind of depends on your outlook. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I think all of us uh, uh, in Yarmouth were very optimistic about where things were going. Um, I would be a little bit less optimistic right now, although I have uh, sincere hopes that uh, Dennis will come back to the table. Uh, we had had a cancellation of a meeting, uh, and um, we're hoping that uh, that is a temporary uh, uh, step on their part. And I think they are taking time to consider uh, their their response to proposals that we have put in front of them. Um, the regional agreement is an old agreement. It uh, dates back to the original construction times of Mattakees, and uh, it's a dinosaur, and it needs to be extinct. Uh, we want, our town wants to uh, construct an entirely new agreement. You, you can't start from nothing. You got the old agreement in front of you, but but a, but there are so many sections of the current agreement that really need modification in order to make the whole process for the future uh, smooth and, and and enhance the relationship between the two towns. And I think that's that's really our um, that's one of our major objectives with our group. Um, I'm not going to talk in, uh, about the financial proposals that uh, we have made, um, but they're very significant and um, they have immediate bearing on the Mattakees project. So, uh, you know, we, we really need to have everybody back at the table and talking uh, constructively about how we move forward as a, a regional district. Two questions I had was um, you had mentioned in the email that there were three petition articles. Pending. Yeah, they're coming to me. Uh, Phil's putting the language together. As soon as I get that, I'll send it to you. Do you know any idea of what the topic is? Uh, You know, it, uh, one of, I did know one of them. Is it one of them safe community, community center? Oh, one of them was to uh, not put any further town resources into this driving the site group. That's one of them. I don't. I don't one of uh, another one's the safe communities act too. That's right. And then so there's another one. Yeah. But I'll have that to you now tomorrow. Okay. And um, I forgot to mention it during the um, agenda review, but the dog park soil any of the can yeah. get on it. Consent agenda. Yeah, so on the consent agenda is an interesting opportunity that came to us, uh, very similar to the solar panels that were installed back in 2010 on Town Hall and at the uh, DNR building. This is a project run by CBEC. It's round three of the project, and they uh, are asking for permission to lease the rooftop of Fire Station 1 and 3 for a PV array. Uh, Fire Station 1 is behind the meter power. It would uh, generate about $8,000 as proposed in savings. And then the one at Fire Station 3 is a much larger unit, and that would yield somewhere in the neighborhood of about sixteen dollars to $17,000 in savings. So the language uh, that is in front of you on consent agenda would uh, allow the developer to put the uh, solar panels on the roofs of those two buildings. Is this the same language as we used on other ones? I get. I guess I'm just. Uh, yeah. So we didn't participate. There's been this is the third iteration of a CBEC generated solar program, and we didn't participate in uh, round one or two. And so this is language standard language that has been used up and down the Cape to. Uh, 
put solar panels on these public buildings in, uh, as a for instance, uh, in this particular round three, there'll be seven rooftop mounted projects, Eastern Library, Chatham Fire Station, Oak Falls Fire Station, Provincetown Water Tower, Treatment Plant, and then Provincetown Veterans Memorial Community Center, and then the two Yarmouth Fire Stations. So this is a, an effort by CBEC to continue to deploy solar, small scale solar panels on these uh, public institutions uh, up and down the Cape. I guess I'm concerned with Oregon. As far as? Well, it says on two Yarm fire stations. Yep. Which two? I think, you know, we entered. One and three. Well, I know you said that, but that's not what we're voting on. So, um, and then it just talks about the board of selectmen in each town are authorized to rent buildings or portion of buildings. Well, it's the rooftop language. It's it's for the rooftop. That's, that's what they're looking to put the panels on. No, but I mean, if you just read it in, in itself without any explanation, you wouldn't know that. <coughs> that's the way it should be. Yeah. I know, I know we're getting the background, but this is what's going to stand up with what our agreement is, and I don't think it's specific enough. And um, Well, Town Council is reviewing the documents, and it was one of those uh, situations where this has been, uh, the CBEX Council has prepared these documents for us, and they had sent us indication that um, this is standard language that they've used up and down the Cape. But uh, we can wait for Tallerman to get back to us yeah. on what their commentary is. Yeah, I would just ask him to review this for us before we... Is there a push on? I'm not against it. I'm just saying I think we need to be protected to make sure that we have... Uh, well, there is a deadline to get uh, installations done, but I mean, we are having a meeting on the 30th of January, so... Um, well, well, is it needed prior to that? Well, no. Be, well, I mean, they, they've been interested in getting started, but I don't think because we're the one week delayed isn't going to make a huge difference. Okay. And Jay hasn't looked at this yet? He's, he's got it back in the to Jay's office now. You happen to ask him if he's looked at it. Well, it's up to the board. Well, I, I, I think you're right. I, <clears throat> if it's not specified, they can pick the best two that they, they want, regardless of Dan's iteration of what you know the background is. Well, isn't that based on what we put in this uh, the motion? In the motion? Well, what I'll do is just to make everybody at ease, I'll, I'll uh, work it the way you want it to do. We'll present it at the 30th meeting and it'll be the way you want it to do. Okay, I don't want to miss out on an opportunity. All right, I don't think a week's going to make a okay. difference. Okay. Okay. It's up to the board, though. If they're comfortable with the way it is, then. Okay. So we'll hold that. Yep. Is there a motion on the consent agenda with holding that? Item. So well, that's it. That's the only thing I need. So I move to hold that. I guess we just don't need to make a motion to approve the consent. No, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
water solution, clean water solution would look like uh, between the two towns. And then uh, Friday we meet again with Harwood Chief Dennis and uh, talk about uh, moving that project forward. There's likely to be uh, sometime, maybe in February, but more likely March, to bring Harwich, the boards from Harwich, Dennis, and Yarmouth back together to give you an update as to where we are from one year ago's time frame. That'll coincide with what's on the agenda on February 13th, where um, council will come back to you and brief you on the steps that we put, in, put for him for consideration to go to you related to uh, future legislation to get us into this process of negotiating a, a wastewater treatment entity, if you will, and then dialoguing between the three towns as it relates to what that structure would look like. So, so Jay will walk us through that on the 13th. But come after that process, um, we'll step up the level of effort as it relates to engaging any other towns to see what that looks like. I have a question on the capacity in, yeah. in uh, Barnstable. Yeah. Um, and do they have the capacity or could they build capacity yeah. on their existing site for our entire town? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> that might be a heavy lift. But okay. what they did say is the site has got really good capacity availability to expand. And they, they did add to us, and we got to chase this down, but apparently uh, they have got or had some communication with DEP that if there was a regional wastewater agreement struck along the Cape, the DEP would look more favorable upon some kind of outfall pipe for effluent as opposed to land-based effluent discharge. Mm -hmm. So that's new to us. We have never heard that before as part of uh, the solution. It's not Louis Bay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you heard that? Oh, yeah. oh. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Nine miles off. Yeah. Uh, so their, their challenge, though, of course, is effluent discharge. They have nowhere to put any effluent. So our conversation with them would be related to if we're sending, we've also got to be able to take what's coming off of that and then maybe some potential future because it's a give and a take at that point. We do yeah. have capacity to take on that. Well, so the last time we discussed it, I remember it was the two, building two, two pipes for yeah. the expense. Yeah, so you know, part of that conversation will be revisited, but also to cue off of a DOT improvement on through 28 that would help. If DOT is going to rip up 28 to begin with, mm -hmm. we can get some pipes in the ground to coincide with that, that would help to fray some of the cost. So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of uh, unknowns, more unknowns than there are unknowns, but, but we're sitting at the table and dialoguing with them on these topics, so it's good. Okay, I, I guess my, my I, I think we need to be, if, if we have the possibility of, of two solutions, mm -hmm. uh, we need to be careful not to be uh, totally dependent on, on uh, one of the solutions. Yeah. And just to remind you, the reason why we, we struck out the Barnstable was that our delivery cost of the infrastructure to get this end of, you know, west end of town up to the plant proposed in Dennis is right. just gargantuan. So right. anything we could do to cut down that cost was going to be a win. So I, I will put this plug out there. I'm still looking for residents to be part of the wastewater the resources clean water committee um, because we do have to get that team put together uh, but uh, but and also Jay will remind you through legislation that was passed some years ago that the board of selectmen are the sewer commissioners uh, in this and water and water. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say before we leave um, Mark I still need um, the evaluation for Dan your evaluation and I have a question for Dan when it relates to, I was having a hard time answering a lot of questions when it relates to um, professional development and staff. I honestly don't know what your plan is in that. I don't know if you have a one minute explanation that you can kind of. For, for like our particular staff? Yeah. Yeah, so, so in some of the uh, past agreements uh, that have been struck is there's uh, a certain amount of dollar allocation in the budget to provide opportunities for advancement. And then we've signed off on a DNR officer. He's continuing to work, I think, now on his master's degree, right? So we, we do have, um, and this is part of, one of the things that we wanted to have more robust is uh, staff development opportunities. That's one of the reasons uh, for the HR position. Mm -hmm. So there's internal trainings that can be done, that can be trainings done staff to staff, and we'd like to do much more of that. But a lot of that we were we were sticking with the standard quote for this past year, 
but with this new position, that's a lot of emphasis is developing, uh, taking our, our, our people and developing further talent as they so desire. So, so that will be part of the HR yeah, class is yeah. to pull that together in, more, in a formal way. And I think that's a good I mean, direction. Some of our department heads have been really good about that already to the point yeah. where um, staff, new staff that's been brought on, multidisciplinary training. I know Jeff had a new staff member brought on and we were able to train them ahead of time in finance on finance tech matters and it worked out really great. So there's a lot of that that's been going on amongst the staff and that's really good. So. I know I've looked at that a couple times. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything else? Do you have anything else? No, that's it. Yeah, motion to adjourn. Everybody over sleep? Yeah. <laughs> Is there a second? Well, if you can't, the motion is seconded.